The world always has an original, whether it is in art or whether it is in every day. What happens if this is replicated and remade? Does it live up to the original? The Literary License Podcast explores the world of the original and remake as we explore and see if the remake truly stands up to the original. With your hosts Joe Randazzo, John Wilson, Vicki Ray, and Keith Chago, where they ask the question, does the remake live up to the original? Hello, welcome to the Literary License Podcast in Season 6, when we start our make remake for Season 6, which will be Batman from 1989, and Batman Begins from 2014. Five. Five. 2005, okay. Did you watch the wrong couple. one? <laughs> no, there's only one Bat. There's only one Batman Begins. So only one Chris Nolan. So before we get started, let's find out who's with us. We got Vicky Ray with us. Hello, Vicky. Hi, everybody. We got Joe Rendazzo. Hello, Joe. Hey, everyone. And John Wilson will be with us later, but unfortunately, he's tied up at the moment. Um, hopefully, by someone good looking. So oh, before please. we get started, <laughs> let's find out what we've been up to. Let's start off with you, Vicky. What have you been up to since last time we spoke to you? Oh God, it's been so long. Um, not any, not a whole lot. I was telling yesterday, our person the interview probably thing. I live a very boring life. Um, not much. Uh, Asher's taking a break from sports. We're just getting ready. Well, it's pumpkin time, so we're doing all things pumpkin. You know, all the all the pumpkin stuff is going on. So, and it's Halloween time. We can wear our pumpkins in our head and feel t-shirts and watch all of our scary shit. Um, what did I start watching? Um, I watched, started watching Hulu's Haunted History. Pretty good. I think I'm up to get the Battle of Gettysburg. Pretty cool shit so far. I really like. Oh, this are, are those the old History Channel things? Just on. Hulu I don't know now, where or? they come from. <laughs> Hulu's got them on, but they're, it's like Haunted History, and a are lot of it's new- pretty good. Are they newer or, or older? I think that they're probably older because mm-hmm. they were mentioning stuff that probably was pre-COVID. So I'm assuming it's pre-COVID stuff, but I just oh. love that kind of crap anyway. I've always loved those too. That uh, it, it, I gotta check it out. Hulu's got a good one. Hulu's got a good one. I remember. You might have uh, seen I remember them. I used then to again, all those. they had a couple things on there that I hadn't seen, so it was worth watching. And I totally nice. binge watched Cobra Kai like a little bitch. Could not stop. And I don't know. I'm not gonna give anything away, but he seems to think there might be a season six coming. I think they're gonna beat the hell out of it as season six. I think that that's all they're gonna get out of it is one more season. I read if somewhere. Um, I read somewhere yesterday that there's talk about bringing Hillary Swank into it. Yeah. <laughs> why not? Well, she's Go doing other things, but kid. why not? They brought everybody else back, you know. Yeah. I think my favorite character is Chosen, though. I, out of all of them, the the the, the mean old uh, uh, Japanese nemesis that uh, Karate Kid had. Yeah. I love him. Out of all the characters, I think I love him the best. He kills me. This last few episodes, I was rolling. <laughs> I just love him. I like how he tries to Americanize this old battle axe warrior Japanese Shinto guy, you know, whatever you want to call him. But uh, there's, I- there's some great lines as well, like the guy with the oh, ponytail. Yeah. And they go, where did this where did this James Bond villain come from? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Now, I haven't seen Cobra Kai, but I've seen Karate Kid 3. And he plays that like a fuck, like an over the top Bond villain. I know uh, yeah. uh, you're talking about, uh, God, what's his name? Um, uh, I don't know what guy. his real name is. Ralph, yeah, it's, it's the deal. villain from Karate Kid 3 that you're talking about, though, yeah. right? He's yeah. so over the top in that movie that I just, like, he's talking about, like, oh, you know, the, these damn bureaucrats, they don't even let us dump toxic waste in the, in the oceans anymore. I'm like, wait a <laughs> <Yeah>. second. <laughs> Are you the bad guy by chance? <laughs> definitely not. Definitely not the '80s anymore. That's for sure. Well, yeah, another, I used to be able to just dump is, toxic is... waste wherever I wanted. These damn bureaucrats are stopping me from doing that. Like, right. yeah, I'm gonna go out on a limb. You're the villain. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I but I also like that they brought um for a short time his girlfriend from Karate Kid Three. Because yeah. I always liked her. I mean, she did like Teen Witch and things like that, didn't yeah. she? That actress, and they got to see what she looks like now. So that was quite cool. It's like, oh god. So. They brought back a lot. They brought back everybody thus far that I could remember. Yeah. I mean, this this last even the last four or five episodes of Cobra Guy, a lot more have been brought back in from the '80s, and it's fucking great. I just love it. I just mm. sucked it all up. I, I I love that series. I cannot sing its praises enough. Go and, to Spirit uh, Halloween. 
Spirit yes. Halloween has uh, has Cobra Kai uh, Cobra Kai stuff. Oh, it does. Yeah, uh, Shanta asked me next time I went if I if I see the Cobra Kai socks to grab them for her. So I did see them. They they get a huge Cobra franchise Kai stuff. with merch now. There's no doubt about that. Why hey. not, man? Uh, if you can get that money, get it. Get the capitalism. I'm a sent a Cobra Kai T-shirt, so that's cool. Yeah. Uh, and I'm going to finish what way I finished. I binge watched all of Vikings Valhalla because I missed the old show so bad. It doesn't have that ping that the original Vikings had, you know, but mm. I still love it. it. It's pretty good. We'll see what happens with their second season. And I'm going to watch, what is it? Uh, Lord of the Rings, whatever. What is it called? The Rings? Or is it the, the Ring? Well, power, power of the Rings? Power of the like Rings. That? I love it. Power Everybody, the did, all the Game of Thrones people are being mean to the trilogy people, but I like both of them. So far, you know, it's the slow. It's just, they're both it's Star, slow it's Star Wars versus Lord of the Rings. All oh, over my God. Again. No, it's going to be like <laughs> Star Wars versus Game of Thrones people. Now, those people are vicious. I mean, political forums are terrible enough. But I was telling Keith, boy, you get in those Game of Thrones, man, those people are vicious. They're just bloodthirsty. If you say something that's wrong or off color, then they're like, I'd be like white on rice. But I'm when enjoying you- the new Game of Thrones, too, but... Yeah, when you go down the rabbit hole of fandom, like the, the the further down you go, the more you, no matter what it is, whether it's Star Wars, Batman, anything, anything, the further down you go, you start running into these people who are like, my opinion is everything. Yeah. I am right. All hail, you know, whoever, Ryan Johnson, Zack Snyder, they could do no wrong. Yeah. And I will kill you if you say otherwise. And you're going to run into a lot of those. Those the are the people they're like messing with. Just well, drop the, I my mean, they, mom and leave. No, I mean the thing is, there's not even, there's not even. I wouldn't even get into it with them because at the end of the day, these are people who have not seen the light of day for like twenty to thirty. Probably years. not. <laughs> they're still playing D and D old fashioned way, you know. Yeah, there's, there's, yeah, people who get like to that level. There's no point talking about. It. There's absolutely no point. Well, they did. They, they. I think they have a break with reality at some point. Like I posted, so I find thing I found it here. It was on Twitter. This guy goes, "It's nice to see them using real dragons instead of fake CGI dragons." And I'm like, "Is he fucking with us?" But you know, I put it out there. It's just like you know, <laughs> don't know if he was serious real, or not. <laughs> real dragons, huh? <laughs> real dragons. Use real dragons instead of them CGI things. But I don't know that. I mean, we're just hanging out, living life. But what about if that, that church, if that control. church, if that church in the south part of America, you know, in this uh, um, can build Noah's Ark and put dinosaurs on it, I am sure that there are real dragons in the world. <laughs> There's a dragon somewhere, damn it! I'm saying it. precisely, <laughs> same as there was dinosaurs on Noah's Ark. I sure I'm, just, I'm mother of dogs, not dragons. I have dogs. <laughs> so. What about you, Joe, or whoever's breathing? I, I just had, I just had to mute it for a second because Keith had me laugh so hard that it, it started a coughing fit. <laughs> All right, I need a second to compose myself, but yeah. Uh, what what have I been up to? Um, I I worked all weekend since the last time uh, since the last time I was on with you guys. I was off Monday and Tuesday, but uh, we're so short staffed at work that I'm so exhausted on Monday that I can't like I I don't even really get up. I, I get up around 4 p.m. go go do my my grocery shopping on Monday afternoon. Come home, um, and then Monday's uh, and, actually a good day to go grocery shopping. Yeah, there's nobody there. You 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 can you can walk through the grocery store Monday afternoon. There is nobody there. Usually, their fresh trucks come early in the morning. Also, week. yeah, also that. Um, yeah, I, mon- I, I've had Monday and Tuesday off. Have been my like my regular days off since like. I was working security at a college in, in Brooklyn in like the, the early 2000s because Monday and Tuesday are the best days off because nobody's anywhere. You yeah. can run all the errands you need to run like that and like be done with it in like an hour, be home and you are good. You can enjoy the rest of your day off. If you, your weekend is Saturday and Sunday, you got to deal with crowds everywhere you go. Everything's going to be delayed. So I, I love having Monday and Tuesday off for that reason. But yeah, um, been doing my uh my halloween uh i started my halloween watching early uh i, I haven't gotten today's movie in yet because i i just got up right before we did this and uh i've been uh 
I watched Batman Begins again last night, so so that it'll be fresh in my oh, mind. Oh, I just today. finished watching <laughs> it again too, just to make sure I had the right Batman. I was sitting there, I was starting to question myself because it was I, I could only find one on Hulu and not on with the all the others, and then I figured, well, one's Warner, one's different. they're all Warner. Well, Hulu oh. only carries Batman Begins because the other ones wasn't carrying it. So, and I, I go, okay, I've seen this, but I just refreshed my memory on it. So. Oh, I, I live with the uh, with, with the biggest Bat maniac in history. Because Sean, if I if I don't have it on on DVD, if it's He's Batman related, it. Sean has it on Blu-ray. I'm so. surprised he isn't joining us today. Uh, he he actually didn't join us because he thought there'd be like like ten people. And he'd be like, you'd never get a word in edgewise. Oh boy, so he, he's always yeah, welcome. He's, He's gonna yeah. Oh, I, I I told him like, dude, if you if you change your mind, let me know. But then yeah, he's he's off doing other stuff, I guess. Um, but yeah, he he would have joined us if he would have realized it would have been just the four of us again. Mm. So Sean, we wish you could be here. <laughs> um, actually, I'll, I'll text him. Maybe he can join us later. Um, right here. Oh, you are here. I thought you ran out and ran out. <laughs> Dude, it's just me, Keith, and Vicky. If you want to jump on and talk about these movies, yeah, send me a like, I'll jump. Are you looking for a graphic design that will take you to the next level, or something that shows confidence within a growing market to help you stand out amongst the crowd? Amazing Designs gives consistent and on-brand designs. Whether you are looking for something conservative or you want to let your imagination soar, they bring professionalism to a high standard, and they are able to visualize your ideas and give them that extra edge. Working one on one with their designers will give you a design that will live up to your expectations and more. Affordable, expert designs for all occasions, whether it's logos, brochures, or whatever you can dream of. Amazing Designs is your to-go place for creativity and hands-on expertise. Try Amazing Designs today. Contact them via email at amazingdesigns505 at gmail.com. That's amazingdesigns505 at gmail.com or reach out by phone at Crunchy Cold 1-805-203-0427. We love them so much here at the Literary License Podcast that we use them ourselves. But I'd rather be different than be the same. All right, we're back. Yeah, okay, we're back. Um, well, what I've been up to is um, work and there's no sense to talk that, but we did interview Ivy Austin, who was in Greece too, and she done lots of stage shows and stuff like that. And that'll be out on Friday as our Dark Shadows goes into hiatus until we get more information on Tom's um, recovery and we wish him the best of, yes, best we of do. luck and getting well. Um, this one, um, I did watch my Batman films this week, but I have to sit there and say one of the best things I saw was on Disney Plus was Santa Evita about. It's a Argentinian series about Evita, uh, Eva Durante de Perón or Evita Perón right. and about her body after it was embalmed. And what oh, I know. I've read I've read articles and <laughs> in-depth stuff about that. And that is some wild shit. It was phenomenal. I mean, it's seven episodes long. Each episode is an hour. It does flash back to her beginnings as well. So you do learn more about yeah. Eva Durante. That's on Disney? But, Disney Plus, yeah, in this wow. country, it's, Arge- it's Argentinian as well. Plus. So, well, a lot of that was very irreverent things that happened to her. I'm surprised that they would have a show of that caliber on Disney. Oh, then again, it's Disney. <laughs> what am I thinking? Well, I mean, I mean the the important thing about this show is it's an Argentinian show, and up until ten years before, if you mentioned her name in Argentina, you could you could be in prison. Right. So obviously, that's been lifted. So. But I highly recommend it. It was I was just like, wow, this is great sort of thing. So I watched every single. I would love to see that. What's it called? Santa Evita. Santa Evita. Okay. So, but yeah, I highly recommend it. I mean, it's just like, uh, is I mean, it is is it in English or is it just Espanol? Espanol. Okay. So, but it has subtitles. Just make sure that you manually put the subtitles on for it so unless you speak spanish and then you'll be fine to go i can pick up some stuff but i'm better at dirty words <laughs> aren't we all <laughs> <laughs> sounds like my mother my, my mother with english uh, my uh she couldn't speak a lot of english but she could motherfucker with the best of them yeah <laughs> it was amazing at that she knew Your all mom italian right oh yeah 
My grandfather <laughs> straight off the olive oil boat, man. He used to bite his hand at me. Mm, oh, yeah, that. my mother used to do that there. <laughs> <laughs> I still don't know what that means after all these years. <laughs> I, 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 I'm assuming it means something like, oh, you, you, uh, I'm biting my hand so I don't, I don't use it on you. I, I'm assuming that's what it means. Uh, but yeah, she, she could, she could not speak a lot of English, but she knew motherfucker and she could pronounce that like a fucking native. <laughs> yeah, but it's really sad what they did to Vita Perone, though. Really, a lot of just a lot of horrible things happened. Even after she died, I mean, it's sacrilegious most of it. So it should be interesting, I'm sure. Oh, it's really good. I didn't realize that they actually did have three other body. Uh, they also had three other bodies, so that way when they were getting rid of her, they didn't know which body was going where. Yeah. And, did they ever figure yeah. out which one was which? Yeah, I mean, they, they found the real one. She's now back in the, she's in the family tomb back in Argentina Tina now. But she disappeared for 25 years. Her That's body wild. Did. Such a wild and story. They, and they found it, they found it of all places in Italy. You never know about those Italians. They're, they're scat. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, this, this doesn't take anything away from the show, but the weirdest thing is, is that when they, they, when they dug her back up in Milan, Italy, her body was very, very much still in, so right. pr pristine because when they um when they basically added you know ho however they did the process of keeping her body pristine like a porcelain dog stayed but the weirdest thing is that Juan Perón was living in Spain so he had her body transported over with his new wife who he said and then he would hold like these um rituals over her so that the new wife who was like 21 could be the new evita this is not in the show this is what you read like after after the show right ended. And, it's a it's, and, it's a it's a and, and kept story, but kept her body kept her body in the living room with him and his <laughs> new wife and then when they went back to argentina they brought the body over with them so it's not like okay so that's why but, I'm always scared of my children. They always say they're going to like ha take me to a taxidermist and not bury me. <laughs> I don't trust them little bastards. <laughs> they would probably do something like that to me. <laughs> I would do. I would do that to you very easily. I know you would. <laughs> <laughs> just have you have Chaplin's body also being stolen, like after he died? Yeah, I think Charlie Chaplin's I body also. Yeah, he, really? went, he went missing for a little while. Yeah, I just don't understand the whole thing about taxi. I mean, the thing is, the taxi derma human body because thing is, is, like when she had cancer, right? They just couldn't give her pain medication because that would do something to the process. So basically, all her organs and everything are still inside her, and they were basically just taxi. Like, Let's not even talk and, about how they defiled her after she died. I mean, just awful things happened to this body when she. I don't know. But for two, for her, <laughs> but it was but to to do to do the process they put her through it was a two year process. Oof, I had no idea that this all happened after she died. Well, people yeah. back then, especially I'm sorry, but the Spanish and the Italians, we are a bunch of just no I th people I, I, to death. Well, to be honest, I think the reason why I don't know, I I'm, I'm still trying to figure out why they would do that, but I got a feeling that. I think Juan Perón did that because him getting voted in was all because of the power because of her. Because of her. Because yeah. she was, she was, I mean, she was dirt poor. I mean, she slept her way to the top, which explains why Madonna was so good for the movie version. But, <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, it's like art imitating life. Yay. But um, she did good in that movie, though. But she, uh, well, it was a huge music video, so we the didn't have to hear her talk. It's, it's really well, good. Madonna's problem with her acting is her voice is fucking annoying, isn't it? Yeah. So, but um, but you know the thing is, is that um, yeah. So I think may I just I would think that maybe that's the reason why they kept her embalmed and possibly embalmed yeah. her. And I mean, and of course, dictatorship went in and Peronism went out, and but she was like. You know, that's the saint of the desk of Misados, wasn't she? The shirtless ones, the poor. And she, she's the, she's the one who gave women rights to votes, and she gave labor it's laws. It's a fascinating story. It really is. It's a really fascinating story. I'll have to watch that now. I'm a, yeah, I'm a ghoulish person anyway. So. The, other, the other interesting thing I saw Disney uh, uh, release was the trailer for uh, Werewolf by Night. Really? Which looks like it'll is be... Is it uh, a black werewolf or a white werewolf? I, we're not we're not going there I mean, we'll, 
We'll, we'll see. We'll we'll see what the complaints are here. But um, but yeah, it's it's a black and white. Uh, or at least I. It looks like it's gonna be black and white. It looks like it's gonna be a black and white one hour Ooh, special. Cool. Looks like it's kind of a throwback, like maybe a tribute to horror movies of the '30s and '40s. So really, uh, that's on Disney or Hulu. Um, it's gonna be on Disney Plus. It's a Marvel. It's a Marvel thing. Uh, it's gonna be. Uh, if I looked on IMDb. It's it's. Uh, IMDb has it as being about an hour long, which is what those movies ran in the '30s and '40s. Yeah, Generally, true. they ran about, you know, about an, an hour to an hour and fifteen. So. Um, that comes out October 7th, so I'll check but that will out. Will there be armadillos? <laughs> I'm still oh. trying to get over the armadillos. I, I just, why were there armadillos in Transylvania? Uh, in to be honest, if, if, if you look at a lot of those universal films anyway, in the background, there are a lot of strange animals running around for God knows. What was the, what, when Nosferatu had, what was it, the hyena they were using for a werewolf or something? Wasn't it Nosferatu that had the hyena? Yeah. Uh. Uh, I mean, I, I think it was just it's Southern California in the 1930s. I mean, what do they know about what's in Transylvania? Oh, I just they thought don't... it was funny because we're talking about Dracula, Bela Lugosi, 1931. We were watching it last week and it was the uncut version, which I've never seen some of those. Like in the Frankenstein I was talking about, I have never seen the actual footage of where he throws a little girl in the water. Frankenstein or Boris Karloff didn't like that scene. And I've never seen that before in any version. And I was like, so, I, so we just st stuck it out, watched Dracula too, as well, because we love all those old movies. Frankenstein had a lot and of possums and Castle Dracula. I don't see. I don't. I I don't see the problem of Frankenstein throwing a little girl into the water because I mean that's that's basic. That's how most of our parents taught us how to swim. Well, that's how I learned how to swim. <laughs> My brothers were assholes. <laughs> the thing about that clip, because I've I've seen the movie without without the scene where he throws a little girl in the water. Because I I um, growing up, mm -hmm. the first version of it that I got my hands on was a video store was selling off their old 1980s VHS tape, um, mm -hmm. and that was before they found all the footage and edited edited it back in. So I had only seen the monster playing with the little girl, yes. and then cuts to the 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 villager then the playing the little girl. Her to the and square I feel like it yeah makes it darker i feel like it actually makes it darker because you i don't thought it did without showing it but um yeah the other, i've the just other never seen cut, it before that's all the other major cut um that that was eventually restored was um colin clive's uh line it's alive it's alive in the name of god now i know what it feels like to be god that was cut out for a long time for like 50 years that was gone right. and that was restored like in the 90s can you I imagine think. any other person with that particular part doing that particular line i can't ever see anybody else do that I mean, I, he's fantastic isn't he uh, he's mm -hmm. absolutely fantastic uh, it's a shame that he died so young because he probably could have could have done a lot of really really cool stuff uh yeah. in the monster verse him and dwight fry i think also died kind of young uh, a lot a lot of those a lot of those people that were in the frankenstein film died not too long after and they, they, like a, you kind of wonder like how how much cool stuff they could have done it's sad actually there's so many but yeah yeah but i got strayed way before we were supposed to no tangents before the podcast started <laughs> <laughs> we're already there <laughs> well sean's joined us let's talk about sean what have you been up to since we last spoke to you a week ago uh well in the last week i saw clerks three and i uh -huh. broke down hysterically crying uh watching that movie it's i didn't realize how closely i i have uh identified with a lot of the characters in those movies over the last 30 or so years. And uh, it, it was kind of an emotional ride for me going, uh, uh, watching that. And it's probably his best movie that he's done in a very long time. So uh, other than that, just uh, continue working at the bar and uh, joining Joe along with his uh, Halloween movie watching. I've been seeing he's that. always got the best list. I ask him every year since I've, I've got to know him. Where's your list? I, <laughs> That's I, a good I, one. I just copy yeah. the horror hound list. That's I, I just do the horror hound list because the selections I, I that you choose from those from that from that list are, are really what uh, matters. And what do you got are a lot of gems in there. You found well, a lot of ones that I've never seen before. So, well, I try to I try to make it things that I've never seen before, because otherwise I, I don't want to end up watching the same 
10 or 20 movies every year for Halloween. So I, so I, I take the, the horror hound list and I use it as a jumping off point to try to find something that fits that category that I've never seen before. Sometimes they're duds like play motel. The other night was awful. Mm. Um, but sometimes like, like shh, the octopus was really, really good. And I, I never would have watched it if it, well, I probably would have because I, I'd seen the transformation. The octopus. That, that movie that, I couldn't take last week was mosquito. That one, I, I struggled so hard. To stay away. Well, you, you have to check it out. It's on, it's on Tubi, I think. Try to stay awake. Today's it's a, it's uh, some mosquitoes. They, they find this, this, this nuclear waste. And of course, they uh, eat it. And then they go inject people. You know, your typical mosquito, large mosquito. Uh, I'll probably have to finish watching is, it. Damn you, COVID. Watch a film, about, uh, watch a film relating to, to a pandemic. So I've... Uh, I've chosen a version of Mask of the Red Death starring, you guessed oh. it, Frank Stallone. Hey, no! Right. No! <laughs> talking, Seriously? It's my it's favorite on YouTube. Oh, you gotta go with that. You gotta go with Frank. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've seen the Vincent I, Price one a hundred times, so. I hope, he sings this, I hope he sings the theme tune in it, so I'll make oh, it really yeah, worth that'd it. That'd be great. Quite a crooner. I was wondering what it's like saying. being Rocky's brother. Yeah. So yesterday was watch a trashy movie. I chose Play Motel, and I watched that. You know, I watched that late late at night the night before. Then Sean chose. I chose uh, Wizard of Gore, the remake of uh, Wizard Wizard of Gore from like two thousand was it two thousand seven or something like that. Two thousand seven, I think it said, starring Crispin Glover and Kip Perdue. I, I we both have I've owned never this heard movie. Of that one. Yeah, we have both owned this movie and never watched it. And uh, mm. so I dug it off my shelf. We took a look better than we thought it would be yeah i, I, I yeah. thought it'd be a total train wreck and it wasn't uh jeffrey yeah. well, it's got crispin, well it's got crispin glover doesn't he That's, i mean he always gives, he's a, he always gives a good performance oh, he's, crispin he's, glover he's, brad dorif and uh um, his finest uh and uh jeffrey combs are in it so that yeah. their performances oh. made it worth watching because they're yeah, so over the top uh, jeffrey combs we didn't even recognize yeah, he really? he he looks like Rob Zombie. That's the best way I could describe him. He looks like nineteen late nineteen nineties era Rob Zombie. Yeah, very we were watching dreadlocks that are kind of dusty, dirty looking. <laughs> he, he just has that. Yeah, Rob you think Zombie Rob can afford to get his hair shampooed once in a while? <laughs> he's clean cut now. He, he, when he when he's out in public, he looks really nervous. good. Clean, he looks cut. good. He really does. I mean, I like the the dreadlocks and stuff, but he looks yeah. really good. Speaking of him, I got. I'm looking forward to the monsters next week. Is it next week or two weeks? Oh, uh, we two weeks. Two weeks. I'm just the 27th. Have an open yesterday. mind. Don't be making fun of the Robster. I'm not at all. I love <laughs> Rob. I've been a. I've been a fan of his since I was a young kid. I love his music. He's always got a great live show, and uh, I'm genuinely looking forward to this movie. I. I didn't like the trailer, but that's most of the world at this point. It, I, he was going out on tour, and if he did it himself, maybe he was in a rush. I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt. He loves these I mean, characters. So. His last movie before this one was 31, I think, right? It was, yeah. yeah. No, no, no. It was, I, it was uh, Three from Hell. Oh, that's right. Three from Hell. I forgot about oh, Three yeah, from Hell. Yeah. It, that's, yeah, I think he did, he had to do 31 in order to do three. He, he's been for years wanting to do a Groucho Marx movie. He's wanted to do a story about uh, the Broad Street Bullies, the Philadelphia Flyers. Uh, he's wanted to do a lot of these uh projects that maybe, are very personal to him maybe that's why he did the monsters he went to universal and went hey listen because universal uh wait no does universal yeah universal owns the old paramount library yes. so universal would own the old marx brothers movies like the really early ones yeah. so maybe that's part of it is he went might hey, be a trade-off look, might be a trade -off, i'll, I'll yeah. do whatever you want me to do just let me make this groucho movie maybe that's it maybe mm -hmm. so you never know um, something quite interesting on Shutter. They're doing um, 100 greatest horror films at the moment. So every week they do 25. So I think they're down to 50 now. So I didn't see that's that. quite interesting. I there's not a, yeah, there's not a lot of um, surprises in it, but it does mention a few little things that kind of pop up that you kind of do forget about. They're all kind of on the fringes. I mean, a lot of it's kind of the main stuff, like oh, Candyman or The Exorcist, or <laughs> it's like, I okay, yeah. I just, I just, I don't Evil know. Evil Dead. I, okay. on, I refuse to have The Exorcist in my house. I was raised Catholic, 
<laughs> I still, I watch it. I that the the crab walk. If I could fast forward to the crab walking downstairs backwards, I'd be okay. But that fucked me up like none other. So I mean, that just disturbed the shit out of me. Well, that I, I was re- just that, that was added like in the what the nineties or two thousands. Yeah, the two thousands. That. that was the two thousands. I, I remember that being the version you've never seen, and now it's the only version that exists. It's the only yeah. version I remember. To be honest, the I thought the be- I won't smoke pot and watch because I'm afraid it'll uh, scare me. Well, I think I think I think the reason why the Exodus works anyway, I think it has more to do with sol- the subliminal like flashes that happen within the movie. I think that's what kind of makes it work. You yeah, know, like when, when, she, when she comes in, and then you know, and then you got you got the the demon or whatever flashing up on the hood of the stove very quickly. You know, blink and you miss sort of thing. All those kind the of things. In the theater, and when it was re-released, I remember getting a lot of laughs from the younger people. But those were the moments that jumped out that actually scared people. The, well, the, I would like the, them to the make a movie again. Yeah. I would mm. like them to make a movie again that makes people vomit and throw up and freak out. <laughs> you know, like they did back in the seventies. Like, yeah, I, but, I but, 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 yeah but you got to re- but you got to remember that you're not going to get anything like that anymore anyway, first of all, because when the Exodus came out, well, well, the problem is, not the problem, but when the Exodus came out in 73, 74, this was, this was the end of the, the the movie system, you know, sort of thing. So everything was very, very well controlled. And this was like Hollywood for once actually breaking a taboo here sort of thing before they weren't, I mean, they haven't broken any taboos from like, Till between 1940 and 1970, so yeah, like a kind of like a, you know, you didn't have couples sharing a bed during this time period, right? <laughs> sort of thing. So, you know, so I think I think that's probably a lot that has to do with it because this is like okay, this is a big Hollywood movie, and it's got, and they got big, you know, Ellen Bernstein was quite a name at this point. She was making her name as quite a achievable actress, and you know, so I think, and that has probably a lot of the reasons, and of course. Max van Sydow at the moment was very well respected. And so I think that's probably the reason why it had the effect it had on that. Cause you had a lot of people going, Oh, this is, you know, a great, great Hollywood movie, you know? And of course they got that sort of thing. It's like the same way as my psycho part had the same kind of effect it did at that time, because like, Oh, this is a, you know, this is a universal um, Alfred Hitchcock film. And then when they see it, it's like, Oh my God, what am I seeing here? Is that kind of thing. And yeah, I think, exactly. Yeah, mm. no, no, go ahead, Keith. Well, we've broken so many taboos at this point, anyway. So, I mean, I, to be honest, when I see something now, if something does shock me. It's it's very very rare. I oh, am yeah, so that's... jaded. Uh, <laughs> like I said, I mean... the only thing that shocked me was the geriatric sex and X. <laughs> well, that, that's that's where Ty West had to go. Yeah. Because uh, I, I I recently uh, rewatched uh, Peeping Tom. And that's one of those movies that. that ended Michael Powell's career because the movie was so shocking. And when I watch it now, I'm like, there's nothing yeah. really that shocking about it. But like Keith said, you're coming off the, you know, you're coming off the Hays Code. Uh, yeah. So mm-hmm. once these, once the Hays Code started lifting and people were able to do all this stuff, what are you really going to do? Like you've seen, like Friday the 13th was shocking because, oh my God, I can't believe these gory kills. But now there's been, 12 of those movies and it's like where do you go from here like tom savini like the the cgi now can't match what tom savini and rick baker were doing in the 80s yeah so how are you really going to shock an audience now you're just going to have to go back to just old school storytelling yeah is that so bad no i don't think so it's not so bad. It all depends, you know. If you have a good script and you have a good editor and you have a good director and you got a good cast, you can get away with almost anything. <laughs> the question is, can you get all those together? You know. But um, but yeah, I mean, you know, it, you know, and, and at the moment with Ty West's X, ten years from now, X won't even be shocking. Yeah, because we have a whole generation who's basically been raised on porn anyway, so. <laughs> I can handle oh. porn. I'm just ready for that. That's all. <laughs> I can to be honest, to be honest, uh, when it comes when it comes to the porn market, anyway, I mean, anything that you want to see, you can see for free. Let's put oh, it that yeah. way. It's at that. So, it's at that point. Yeah. I mean, the the other day, a friend of mine was cast on a on a TV show uh, that's shooting overseas, and she sent. And she's you know, tiny little woman. She's playing a prison guard, 
And she sent me a picture of her surrounded by all these like buff shirtless guys. And I joked, I was like, I'm going to put a little Brazzers logo at the bottom of it and repost it on Facebook. <laughs> but the fact that I can make that joke and like everybody gets it, just yeah, what, what's really shocking anymore? Yeah. Talking about shocking, this brings us to Batman 1989, which is a 1989 <laughs> superhero film based on the DC Comics characters of the same name, created by Bob Kane and Bill Finger, produced by John Peters and um, Peter Grubber. It is the first installment of Warner Brothers' initial Batman film series. The film was directed by Tim Burton and stars Jack Nicholson, Michael Keaton, Kim Bassinger, Robert Wall, Pat Hingle, Billy D. Williams, Michael Goff, and Jack Palance. The film takes place early in the title character's War on Crime and depicts his conflict with his arch enemy, the Joker. Um, Bar um, Burton was hired as director in 1986, um, but it would not get greenlit until he made Beetlejuice 1988, which would become a which would become a hit for him. The film is loosely based on Alan Moore and Bill Ballers, The Killing Joke, and Frank Miller's The Dark Knight Returns. The film primarily adapts and diverts from the Red Hood origin story for the Joker, having Batman inadvertently cause gangster Jack Napier to fall into the Axis chemical acid, triggering his transformation into a psychotic Joker. Additionally, Batman creator Bob Kane worked as consultant for the film. So what we'll do is we'll cut to the trailer of Batman from 1989 and I'll be right back. Every punk in this town is scared stiff. They say he can't be killed. They say he drinks blood. Is there a six-foot bat in Gotham City? Vicky Vale. Bruce Wayne. And what do you do for a living? He's a tired old man. Can't run this city without me. Your luck is about to change. Terrorizes. Wait till they get a load of me. He's out there right now. And I've got to go to work. to the literary license podcast we're discussing batman from 1989 and starting with you joe what do you think of batman from 1989 well this was um probably my introduction to batman i mean i was eight years old when the movie came out i went to the theater to see it and i remember the 66 uh adam west series started replaying on tv at this time so it was batmania like that's the one thing i remember um about that era is you batman was everywhere um the pharmacy on my corner had a little vhs tape uh that i think was called batmania and it was just a documentary just discussing batman and all its iterations from <clears throat> the comic books to the 40s to the you know the the, the serials that um uh that, that fox made to the tv series and all that stuff so um the movie itself so i what i'm going what, the reason I'm stating all that is I love the movie and I don't rewatching it. I think it's a very well-made movie. I don't know how much of my love for it is nostalgia because it's, it was my introduction to Batman versus um, how good it actually is as a film. Um, personally, I love it. I love Jack Nicholson in this. Yeah. Like my introduction to Jack Nicholson. I don't think I've seen him in anything else. Uh, I had seen him in anything else before this. I mean, I was eight years old. I wasn't right. going to watch Chinatown. So, <laughs> um, 
So everything about it, like I love, I, I love the old school gothic horror movie vibes to it. Um, I it's dark. It's really like one of the first dark movies, really, when you think about it. Well, up until this point, Batman on television had been portrayed as like this campy, yeah. you know, fun little crime fighter. And this time everything was everything was dark. Batman's killing people, which I know a lot of um a lot of purists um that grew up reading the comics did not like that about it. Uh Burton didn't give a shit. I don't think Burton um really I think he I think he went on record and said he never really read the comics. He read the two comics that he read Dark Knight Return or uh yeah, the Dark Knight Returns and he read The Killing Joke. I think those are the only two comics he's ever admitted to reading. I also think that Burton has a habit of sitting there saying he's a huge fan of something and then makes a movie out of it. He did that with Dark Shadows. Yeah. And then and then and then you kind of watch it and it's kind of like um, did he even the watch he any of the series, you know? Did did he watch yeah. any of that stuff? You gotta wonder. I, I wonder yeah. with the Dark Shadows ser- uh, movie if the because uh, I, I didn't see it until like last year because I just avoided it because I thought the trailer looked so stupid. I mm. wonder if I went in with so my expectations so low because I didn't think it was that terrible. I thought it was OK. Uh, not one of Burton's stronger movies, but Burton's made some really strong, like legitimately strong movies like Ed Wood and um, yeah, Big I love Fish Ed and Scissor Hands. This was kind of the start of that, I guess, or Beetlejuice maybe was this was the start of that. This was the first time you had something with like some real meat on it, um, but I really like it. And now rewatching it a couple nights ago, uh, with the the knowledge of like what Burton was paying homage to um, what, when we're watching this, because Michael Keaton in this is kind of like kind of like Vincent Price in the old AIP movies. He's kind of alone in a dark a dark mansion and clearly he's not right in the head he's clearly going insane and you want to get nuts uh yeah one of my favorite line deliveries ever um i know he's got that poker (laughs) yeah you want to get nuts let's get nuts it's uh like i legitimately love this movie and I, i i think it's well made i don't know how much of that is nostalgia versus probably a little bit of both great uh, yeah it could be both like i it's, <coughs> it's certainly not a I, like i don't think it's a bad movie by any stretch um it's certainly very stylistic and beautiful to look at it was the it, first it, of its kind when it came to that the, to the creation of our, our superheroes really you know i think it just was a i think it gave precedent for what was to come then you got marvel you got dc i think they all springboarded from this one in some capacity this definitely this definitely helped bring along the Raimi Spider-Man movies. And I think that's when people started like attaching the idea that you could actually have depth in the characters. And I feel like the Raimi Spider-Man movies did that better than these movies did. Um, Cause even Superman, which, you know, the, the Christopher Reeve Superman, which I love. Right. Not really that deep. It wasn't until I, I feel like Raimi started doing the, uh, the, the Spider-Man movies in particular Spider-Man two that I think we started kind of seeing like uh, this idea of like the um, the villain being somebody who on the surface may not have been a terrible person, but a victim of circumstance. And, and, and you kind of started feeling for them a little. Um, this movie had none of that. Jack Napier is just a gangster from the very beginning. Um, Jack Palance, uh, as a villain is just chewing the scenery. He's just, uh, everybody's over the top in this. So I kind of enjoy that aspect of it. Uh, it, it kind of feels like a time where like these, these movies were less serious. Whereas, um, you know, the DC movies now are super serious. Everything about them is super serious. So I don't know, maybe I kind of, I, I, I kind of like that. It wasn't anything, uh, anything that, uh, that intense. I mean, I still had intensity, my, but it wasn't that. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, my view of a Batman, Tim Burton's, is that it, it suffers the Tim Burton disease, where it's all style over substance. Yeah, that that's and, a Burton thing. And um, and the thing is, is like you kind of watch it, and it's like it's beautiful to look at, but you don't really care about anyone in it. I don't care. I mean, I I mean, I I remember I remember seeing it, and I'm kind of like, oh, it looks great, and I and I, and I love Batman. I mean, I'm 
I'm indebted to the Tim Burton Batman series because if it wasn't for that, we wouldn't have the animated series, which I think does everything a far better than this canon of Batman films that we have, especially when we get to the Joel Schumacher. Um, let's let's see how camp how camp and gay we can make these. <laughs> so, but while he's still in the closet, while he's still in Narnia doing his films, but yeah. um, but um, was, was he gay? But, I didn't know Joel Schumacher was gay. Oh God, yeah. Oh, I mean, right. think back, think back, think think through Lost Boys and think through the Batman, his Batman series and his Phantom of the Opera and other stuff that he's oh, are yeah. flatliners. So if you start putting it all together, he, he pretty much. I probably know, wouldn't have thought of that unless you yeah, said something. Well, I mean, once you once you kind of realize that you pretty much you know you pretty much can see him <laughs> walking around with a Snow Queen, you know, and eating you know Turkey Delight. So um, why did I think of that? So, I'm sorry to interrupt your uh, train of thought. But you were talking about how <laughs> how it delved into the Schumacher movies. Yeah, and then and of course it gets campier and campier as we go along, and then and then it does you know. But this Batman film sort of thing, it was. There's a lot of things. Everyone's kind of like painted by numbers. And it's like okay, I know Jack Nicholson does his fantastic job as a Joker, but looking at it for, looking at it a lens today, I just think well, this is just you know. Van Horn from Witches of Eastwick. It's the same performance. Yeah, yeah, it is. That he did two that he did two years prior to that. Just as crazy and, so, and batshit, literally. Yeah. Yeah, but it's but it's kind of like you know it's Jack Nicholson doing Jack Nicholson, so it's not a, like a, a huge stretch for him. And then 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 we got Kim Bassinger, who's pretty but bland, really. I mean, she's supposed to be. Well, all you know, the so, characters are bland in this movie for the most part. Yeah. They, they, they don't have a lot of depth as far as emotional human beings. And you know, the one thing that distracted mm -hmm. me in this version because it was ultra HD and the cape and the stuff, and you could tell it was, it was you know what I mean? Like Blu-ray, it shouldn't have been. Uh, it it kind of made me crazy. Funny. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, you it's can see the rubber, you can see, Yeah, you can see every, the, where the lines and the seams are. Yeah, and then you know, like the, the cape where he's standing on the thing and he turns around, you can tell that cape's animated. You know what I mean? Which is, which is why I'm a stickler for DVD for older movies because, like, these movies weren't meant to be seen in that extreme high definition. Uh, Sean yeah, it, and kind, I, it, uh, kind of, it kind of distracted me a little bit. Yeah. Other than that, Don, I love the movie. Just love Don my bought the Blu-ray to Jaws a couple of years ago, and Jaws is the one I go to when I discuss why I do not like Blu-ray. Really? I've never seen it, Blu-ray. You could see the shark clearly everywhere, so you could see how fake it is. And that girl that, that goes swimming in the beginning, right. that girl has a lawsuit on her hands. Yeah, this is a porno now. Yes. Oh, really? You could see it? Well, you knew she was, she knew she was naked. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but you could hide it <laughs> before there's, you can't there's, hide there's it. No there's no hiding this now. Like, uh, there's no, so, it's no every, hiding. so it's yeah. every little boy's PG dream. Anymore. <laughs> well, let's just sit there and say that the world becomes her gynecologist now. Yes, so. yes. <laughs> like, this oh, movie's no, no longer shit. PG. That's, yeah. So much for you, PG. Yeah, it's not PG anymore. No. <laughs> I didn't think of that. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that I get, HD and shit's crazy. I'm, well, I mean, if you want to say that the worst thing about Ultra HD and Blu ray has to be, would have to be Crash of the Titans. That I looks like that's the worst thing you can ever see on Blu ray or um, HD. Yeah. It, it looked better on the pan and scan HBO when you used to watch it as a kid when that would pop up on there every once in a while. So, but I mean, with that, I mean, as I love Michael Goff. I think he's fantastic. I really don't know what Billy D. Williams is doing in this movie at all because it's like, okay, this <laughs> what, is going to yeah, be. What was his purpose? Actually? He was well, Harvey it, Dent. I mean, it's, he's, he's Harvey Dent. That's, that's I know, the but, thing. but what was his point? Well, uh, Har Harvey Dent. Harvey Dent turned into um, Two Face. Right. But um, he's kind of just mentioned, so it's kind of like, oh, look, we got Harvey Dent here, so this could lead to something eventually. But of course, it doesn't go anywhere. Oh well, you know? yeah. No, uh, he becomes white in the third movie. He becomes yeah, Tommy, he becomes Tommy Jones. Lee Jones. Yeah. Oh, that's Frank, right. Yeah. Well, that was a transition. <laughs> yeah. Tommy and, Lee and, Jones um, did it some justice, though. Mm -hmm. There's a continuation of the story of uh, of Billy D. Williams's version where he becomes very anti-Batman. He sees violence breaking out in the street with people dressing as Batman and the Joker. And uh, it, the and it goes on from there where he will eventually become Two-Face. So mm -hmm. they did have plans. This is all based on original ideas and a script from Sam Hamm. 
who um, mm-hmm. he, he turned uh, some of the writings of what they could have done into a comic book continuation. It's called Batman 89. So there yeah. was there were plans for him to possibly become Two-Face before they switched it all up. Mm-hmm. He doesn't even come back for the second one. No, not at all. He's mm-hmm. By that point, he's well, a pitchman for Colt 45. He, 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 I guess he didn't need the money. <laughs> I mean, to give a, give a nod to the second one, uh, most superhero movies suffer in the second one because it's like, okay, we did great with one villain. Let's bring in two and try to tell their story. And all of a sudden you get like this really cramped up kind of version going on. So it's kind of like something gets left to the side of all these kind of movies, whether it's any of the Spider-Man, any of the Marvel or anything like that. The first ones are always the good one, but then they start adding, let's add two villains instead of one. And then you kind of get, well, one villain's well, you know, one villain's really well, you know, scoped out. The other villain's kind of like just kind of there. <laughs> Don't really know what they're there for, you know. You know, in a which, way, Batman. Know. In a way, Batman Returns kind of has three because you have the Penguin, you have uh, the Catwoman, you have Max Shrek, who's totally a villain in that. Yeah. 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 Well, Mac, I guess Max Shrek gives birth to Catwoman in that version. Sort of thing. Well, yeah. you know, you got in the very yeah. beginning, though, it really goes back to why Batman is Batman in this one and why the Joker is a Joker. I mean, you know, what was he well, saying? See, he made me, I, I, I made I, you, you know? Well, see, but I think this is where they kind of get this wrong because they haven't Jack Napier kill Batman's parents. And I have to sit there and say, you know, you see this little boy, parents get killed in it, and there's like, no. I mean, you don't feel anything at all. It's like, okay, they're dead. <laughs> it's kind of like, okay. But I think it's just bringing that um, Jack Napier character in and, and trying to tie him to Batman's killing of the parents kind of is where this film kind of slightly goes off a little bit for I think? me i think so yeah because it's kind of like it's kind of like trying to tie up a loose end where there doesn't need to be a loose end and when we get to batman begins i think it's well, I, I think that's a loose end. i think that's well, batman, a lot better. well batman i think they just wanted I, I think they needed to i think it in all sincerity was trying to show the backstory of batman why batman's batman why is this rivalry going i don't really think that they knew this was going to go any further at this point well, it's not it's that not it's going as far as it has. But, but, what, but what I'm saying is, if you're gonna if you're gonna kind of do a for me personally, I think if you're gonna do a backstory for Batman and you're gonna show this and the reason why he is, you kind of need a little bit of more emotional residence going on to actually give you that feel. Because at the time, his parents get killed, and you're kind of just watching, going so. And that's not <laughs> really what bad. you want to be feeling. <laughs> not really, really because it's like, <laughs> no, because you have you. Boys. No, because the thing is, you have no reference point to the parents whatsoever, except for the murder sequence. That's the only reference point. You, they could have been the, you don't know if they're good parents. You don't know if they're horrible parents. You don't know. Well, you don't they know look if happy. Support. Well, it's all perception. Well, that, is, that, is, well, that is true, because Batman Begins does handle the legacy of Thomas Wayne a lot better than this does. Yeah. Right. You know, so, you know, when we get to that, I think that's done a lot better. And basically it does feel like a kind of lazy storytelling. So that way we're going to, we're going to give a Joker story here and let's tie him to Batman's why Batman became Batman only because it's like, it just feels like a throwaway because if there was like a built up to his parents getting killed in the whole, and the, um, and the emotional residence that he goes through and then what happens to him, like, you know, Michael Goff taking in the boy and raising the boy, and he has some some kind of nod to that. Then maybe him being turned into, you know, the Joker might have had a little bit more, inf- you know, a little bit more residence to yeah, us. I loved, I just loved his performance. Jack Nicholson uh, was so crazy in this one. Though. <laughs> there, there, there is one thing though that that happens because be, because of the, the storytelling in this, and that's the scene. Like he he's given the file. And the side where you, it shows the young Jack Napier, there's papers on top of it. So clearly he's never going through the whole file until after, uh, after the scene in Vicki Vale's apartment where he says, have you ever danced with the devil in the pale moonlight? Yeah, That's just something I like to say to all my prey. That's what finally got him. Hey, wait, let me look at this other side of the file. Oh, wait a second. That's the guy that shot my parents. See, but see, that that's an that's another problem I have with the movie as well. I mean, this is I mean, as far as watching the movie, I enjoy watching it, let it wash over me and not think too much about it. But when you start thinking about it, it's like this is the most traumatic thing that ever happened. You saw your parents get killed by this person, and now this person come ringing in your head after they've been turned into the Joker smile. But you didn't recognize it when he was like when he's dangling over the vat and you're holding his hand that it never came to you at that point. 
I mean, this I is the it, man who, who you saw face to face as a young boy kill your parents in front of you. I don't think that's a face you would quickly forget. <laughs> I see. I interpret it when he uh, when he gunned down all the mobsters on the steps with the, with the mimes. I when mm. Bruce is staring at him the entire time. I he I interpreted it as there's something about this that's familiar, and it's the entire movie is him trying to piece it together. And it wasn't until he heard that that he's able to put mm. the two together. That okay, this guy is the guy that killed my parents. <laughs> there's there's subtle mm. moments where he's kind of reflecting. Okay, he's there's something mm. about this guy and more and more as he's learning it. So I didn't just in, it take it as well. It, that was the one thing that brought it together. There's I, I, there's subtleness to it at least. Mm. What, you, you, you're I, thinking like a repressed memory. Yeah. Like he sees the way he gunned down everybody, just the, how violent it is. The way he approached him, just kind of stunned, get, even getting shot through his coat. And it just still, it felt like someone, like something something you hadn't seen since you were a child, in a way. Yeah. And it just all of a sudden rushes back to you. At least yeah. that's how I, I, I kind of got that when he was standing on his desk. But by that time, Joker is Joker. So it's kind of yeah, like, yeah, gives him the little wave. Yeah. And I kind of, I just kind of wonder why when he was chasing Jack Napier through, you know, the Axis chemicals. Yeah. Well, yeah. Why he, why that didn't come to him, especially <laughs> when he's, especially when he's dangling him and, you know, his face is looking up at him, sort of thing. I just kind of, you know, because to me, I just think that face would always stay embedded to, embedded to you if you're a child, sort of thing. And and it's not like it's it's not like there's a lot of people running around that look like Jack Nicholson either. So there's there's that yeah. he's kind of distinct looking. The yeah. young guy that that that, that they got uh, to to shoot that scene is very distinct looking. It's not yeah. a face you'll forget. No, <laughs> and not at all actually. But what I just love the fact that of... there's a photo oh. on the other side. I just never lifted up the papers and looked. Oh wait, shit! That this Jack Aker guy is the guy that shot my parents. <laughs> I always laughed at that. I always found that hilarious. <laughs> what are your thoughts of it, Sean? Uh, Batman 89, I have very, very fond memories of. Uh, it was my first Batman film in the theaters. I saw it when I was five years old. We went, my mom took me to see the first showing. So much like Joe, I do have a very strong nostalgia for this film. So I don't know exactly how much of my feelings towards it are <clears throat> just that. But I, in going back and watching it, I've watched it. I didn't watch it with Joe in the past week, but I've seen it so many times in the past uh, year that he was literally walking in and quoting lines because I was watching it in the middle of the night. <laughs> he got up to get water and he quoted the lines as I'm hearing excess chemicals exploding, and I'm just just coming out. I'm just like ah, getting a cup of water, quoting the movie, and then going back to bed. Like but how many times have you seen this damn movie? <laughs> it's enough, and I've seen it enough. <laughs> but it's 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 one of those movies that uh, it introduced me to Jack Nicholson. It introduced me. I, it wasn't my introduction to Tim Burton. Uh, Pee Wee's Big Adventure was a was a regular watch. Oh yeah, house. and uh, and uh, Beetlejuice. My parents took me to the theater for some reason. I that was the one time I was quiet. Uh, I, I learned at a young age be quiet in the theater. So uh, that was that was silence for my parents. And Beetlejuice was a fun <laughs> movie, and I and I loved uh, loved the Tim Burton style. And I don't, and much like, I understand what Keith's saying about it, but it wasn't burned out at that point, I don't think yet. Yeah. I think at this point we're looking at it and okay, it's all the usual tricks, all the usual tropes. And the way he built Gotham, this beautiful Gothic city uh, with the die cast models and, yes. and everything, it, it, he brought it to life in such a way that it, it, it just, it's, it's, it stuck with me and it's kind of, the way that they've done that city in every form of media going forward they've it, it, when it's not being chicago being a sub in they, it's kind of been portrayed to be the tim burton version almost in every version now and, did you guys uh, read where they a lot of them i mean even in the next movie they're very unhappy wearing the the, the outfit the batman suit their their necks and everything else i guess they suffered Previously, well, trying to they're film very, this very they're, so well, they're very, very heavy outfits. I mean, it's, even it's when we even when we get to the Chris Nolan ones, I mean, it's still a hard to move. I mean, if you look at Batman in this one, he can't he can't turn his head. He has to move his body. He's like he this, left, yeah. Left, they, left or right. they make a point of it to point it out in the Dark Knight because uh, uh, Christian Bale's Batman mentions it, and uh, 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 what's his name? Uh, Morgan Freeman goes. So you want to be able to turn your head? Want to turn your head. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Yes, it make backing yeah. out of the driveway a lot easier. It would. Mm. 
<laughs> so I mean, basically, you know, if if this is real life and this bat and the Batman in this 1989 version actually lived, basically, you know, he wouldn't be able to see from the sides. Basically, <laughs> he can only yeah. see people coming straight at him. <laughs> he's got he'd also have like a lot of back radar. problems. Yes. Yeah. Well, that, that he's gonna have back and knee problems from falling from the distance that he does That's and true. just kind of landing the way he does. And not how does he not? And they make a point in the final uh, Chris Nolan Batman. No, you have no knees. You have no cartilage in your knees whatsoever. Yeah, just uh, keep that in mind. <laughs> but I uh, mean, I have to. I have to sit there and say though. I mean, it's quite ballsy of Batman to sit there and, and save Kim Bassinger's character by going here. Hold on to this, and it likes to throw. <laughs> so basically, she's only got her upper body arm strength. Like he's yeah. gonna take her all the way to the I top. Have, yeah. Well, what did he you say? She goes, fine. how much she weighs? She goes, I don't know, 106? Or what is it? She said that. I guess apparently she weighed a little more. <laughs> yeah, but the thing is, it doesn't matter how much she weighed because at the end of the day, it's her. she's got to maintain hold her on. upper body strength to hold on to that. Yeah. You know, you know, basically, you know, basically try to, you know, basically just hang out your second floor window by just swinging from your a jump rope. <laughs> How long, how long can you she was supposed to, to die in this movie, but they didn't. They didn't follow through with that. They I think her career know. died after this, so uh -huh. they almost did. I, I think her career died slightly after this. Well, maybe her, I think she, she disappeared into Richard Gere. She after bought this. a. I think she bought a town. There was this story in like yeah. the, yes, in the early night. She, she bought did. a town. She did. That, I don't remember uh, which town it was. I forget what did. it was either. But she bought a town, and that like kind of bankrupted her. I, I, she was yeah. last time I saw her was in the Nice Guys, and she was really good in that. She was very good in LA Confidential. I and think LA that's where they would come back. Yeah. Yeah. She was brilliant in that. So, but yeah, then no, I, I mean, be, but, but really die. She won an Oscar after this. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, no, years. but I'm saying, but her, 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 her career for a movie that was making a lot of money. I mean, she kind of her, her what uh, she she really did because before this, she did make Blind Date with Bruce Willis. Yeah, yeah. So I love she's, that she, movie. But but most of her movies are basically just her as a sex kitten, wasn't it? Like nine and a half weeks and my stepmother so is so an far. alien. I was my just thinking of that. I was like, we just, Sean recently bought the mm -hmm. Blu-ray to my stepmother is an alien. I had never seen it before, I love and that, uh, that was <laughs> like, wow, that that movie was a trip. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I will get the, I I will give this movie credit over Batman Begins when we discuss that. Is I think Michael Goff is fantastic as Alfred. Yeah, I love Michael Goff, and I, 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 he's, he's in my favorite Dracula movie ever, the uh, the 1958 Hammer films Dracula. He's um, uh, fuck, what the, was he? He's not Harker. He's wait, or is he Harker? He's right no. now. Wait, he's Doctor Seward. Any? He? Yes, he. Yeah, he. He's fantastic. I love him in everything. He and this is Burton showing his his love of classic horror because he went and got an old Hammer films. Uh, uh, veteran and Michael Goff was in like every movie he made, almost every movie he made after this up until. I was watching uh, a Hammer's film special yesterday, and I was thinking of you. It was all about Hammer films. I love I I love those movies too. So I, uh, the, you know, this was I, I'm uh, I, th I think I read somewhere that he had tried to get Alan Napier to come back for something, but Alan Napier at this point, who was uh, Alfred in the '60s Batman, right? I think he was too sick to do it, and then he died before the movie came out. But I think he, I, I think I read he tried to get Alan Napier to come in and do something for it. I don't know how, how true that is. I've never heard Tim Burton say anything in an interview. Um, but Burton, I'm, I'm shocked he didn't load this up with horror veterans. Well, he does in a way, but uh, I'm, I'm shocked we didn't see other people pop up. Well, we it. got, we, I mean, we do got Jack Palance who was coming off of Dracula a few years earlier. That's true. His Dracula. So. He's Fantastic in this. I believe this. I guess I, Nicholson was a pain in the ass when he's filming. You know, they had to make those special gloves all the time, the, the Joker gloves. Apparently, he was the, like they said, he took to delighting visitors at Pinewood Studios with an autographed pair of his glo Joker gloves, and they would have to go make more, and he just pissed people off. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, he was annoying. And they said every time Nicholson did this, they had to have new gloves made, and they pleaded with him to stop doing it. And he eventually agreed, but he kept doing it anyway. Mm -hmm. Oh wait, Sean, Sean might be might might be better able to tell uh, to tell this. What was the the, the thing with the contract? I, I know Nicholson. I we we've held him as a genius for what he did with the contract because he he had managed to get himself. He said he 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 turned down his usual fee, but he demanded 
so, a percentage of the gross and the merchandising. Or That's something what like. it was. And so mm -hmm. I I want to say it was something just on that movie alone. He made, he made something like 90 million, I want to say. Like 75 to 100 million in 1989. No, no. Uh, mm -hmm. Just on that alone, so which is brilliant when you think about it. He's absolutely like, oh, brilliant. Oh, and those toys, be, but you got to give me all this toys, on the back end. I, I was five years old. Those toys were impossible to find anywhere. Uh, the the action figures, the play sets, the Batwing, all of them. They they sold out everywhere. Batman, everything after this it was movie. Batmania. Oh, it was Batman, they, everything. They promoted it as the movie of the decade. That was the, the tagline for the movie. And it, I mean, it kind of was, was almost. It kind of was. Yeah. I know mean, I, I we were talking last night or, or was it this morning about the trading card set? Yes, I used to I used to buy all the trading cards. Uh, you have a Batman hat from the original release and you have like all these pins and stuff I on have all it. my original pins. I yeah, don't love don't lose those things. I had Walking Dead <laughs> cartoon I had the comic books from years ago and I gave them away. <laughs> You know, a lot of my, just the trading cards were destroyed in a flood. So I, I this uh, is one of the few things I have left is is this nice little hat with all the buttons. But hang yeah, on to it. Yeah, I, I will. Believe me, I will. <laughs> I well, I mean, when the movie came out, I wasn't. I went to the Dublin premiere party for it. None of the actors were there. It was just the <clears throat> the Warner thingy. So I mean, it wasn't. Right. You know, it wasn't a star-studded event. There was a lot of Irish stars in there that no one knows who the hell they are, but unless you live in Ireland, TV people. But um, but yeah, I remember like giving everything away, and I just remember that it was like the Prince soundtrack playing on repeat over and over. <laughs> so, like okay, it's like I mean it's okay. I mean, but it isn't. It isn't Prince's Purple Rain. It's <laughs> okay <laughs> no it's not prince's best work but i still love the uh the, the, the scene in the museum with party man playing and them throwing paint yeah. on the paintings and like slashing things to the theme no i, I like I this one yeah um, i like this one i keep forgetting what the name of the damn, uh, the damn with painting meat. is sean figure with meat by francois That's... bacon yeah hanging at the chicago art figure Institute. with meat yeah, yeah figure with <laughs> meat. yeah and francis bacon's um picture which is another variation of that picture would actually be red dragon which would make the red dragon um because he also did the the he francis bacon also did the great big dragon be, um that was tattooed on the guy's back oh and the, re yeah. and the rebirth that's francis bacon as well he he made a lot of art that was very very odd for its time period I think at the moment, I think it was like, uh, no, no, no. And now it's considered a genius. You know, it's one of those, one, you know, simple, you know, we hate you. We hate you. You're dead. We love you. It's one of those artist things. So <laughs> There's kind of a recreation of that painting in The Dark Knight uh, when Heath Ledger is filming his video, his hostage video with the Batman clone. He's seated in a meat locker between two, fi uh, two hanging pieces of meat. And uh, the, I believe that Heath Ledger did say that that was kind of a motivation for when he, because he directed that whole camcorder thing. Part of the reason why it's so terrifying, I think, is he, he just embodied that role. But uh, the big it, star, it, yeah. well, the big star of the show is Gotham City. You got to admit, absolutely. I mean, oh, what yeah. they did was just fantastic. I mean, I, I don't think I remember seeing anything quite like that up until that time. It I don't was, know about John. John's uh, being quiet. It was. I didn't know when to come in. I'm here, folks. I was gonna. Come oh, John, you're Joker here. Or Batman, or I was been silently waiting. Speak your piece. I was even gonna say with Jack Nicholson. One might say he laughed all the way to the bank with the money he made. Yeah. Uh, I think that. Yeah. I mean. I love this version of this movie for the city, right? Because of the way the stylistics it set sort of the the bar, the precedence, right? It, it was able to take something from the comic books and bring it to life in that way like in, to me it was like a launching point to where you can go full industrial which is what we're going to go into the next film right. or you can go something that has a little bit of whimsicalness to it that it almost has a little bit of like magic to it in a way like if you you know like you get where this plays on a sense of a bit of like comic sci-fi like ness to it whereas when we get into you know nolan's version 
I think they're trying to almost make it as if this is what would happen in real life if this situation happened and we had a hero and a villain and all this type of thing. And so this, I love that because it puts you in that fantasy of that world. And you almost want to be like, ah, I wish we would build a park like this, you know, because, you know, I'm surprised they haven't actually, that they they built rides around that with, I think. No kidding, that would be great. That'd be kind of cool to build a Gotham like that, you know. Um, they probably would have if um, George Clooney didn't kill the franchise. <laughs> Yeah, maybe <laughs> well, so they put a pin in that one, right? It's like, uh... <laughs> and if, if you really look at it, it kind of looks like the matte paintings that you'd see, like at the beginning of like an AIP or Hammer Films movie, which would you mm. know, with Tim Burton at the helm, he's clearly paying homage to that stuff. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Like, if you ever watch like the first Dracula and you see a Hammer Films production over this matte painting of Dracula's castle, that's what Gotham looks like, right? In, yeah. in these movies. Um, so yeah, I, I like, like Sean and John both. I, I adore, I adore the way the way Gotham looks in these. I have to say, when I first saw this, I I used to be a huge Burton fan. I mean, I you know I went and saw. Pee Wee's Big Adventure when it came out. I saw Beetlejuice, Batman, Batman Returns, and then I think, I think after like Ed Edward Scissorhands, I love Big Fish though. I'll, I'll get that, but I think I would say maybe after Big Fish. Then I found that I think my only problem with him is, is I love the style and I love the look. I just wish we had more depth now because yeah. it's like right, he's been a right you know i mean batman was his third film so i mean so looking back on it i i appreciate it for what it is but knowing where burton would go from here i just kind of wish that he would have developed a little bit more depth in his films as far as his characters go yeah yeah sort of thing i mean i agree because it's almost like it's almost like you're someone who is an artist who is added in this amazing story this world but then I think over time you start to add texture and you add color and then it just kind of muddies the water, if you will. Like, so over time you're forgetting about the story, but now everything is bright and shiny and, you know, they, so I think Burton, I think part of it was like everything he did was like, how can we make this more, you know, like from an artistic point, like a visual, right. Versus like, you're forgetting the story. (laughs) Like you're literally, you're like moved away completely from the story. And, you know, that's where this was, to me, a foundation of that is it's a very simplistic story, a retelling of a story of a man who, you know, becomes a vigilante to fight evil, you know, and right. And it's like, it's not overcomplicated, right? And it's a story that can be told, whereas, you know, some of these stories, they get lost and muddied by, you know, a lot of the visuals and the artistic, you know, it just becomes, gets lost in, in that, so. I feel like he hits his uh, his peak of, of like storytelling and visuals a couple of years later with Ed Wood. I think that's the peak of Burton's career is five years yeah. later. Yeah. I feel like that's when yeah. he got everything right. Uh, I'll, I'll go as far as to say Sleepy Hollow. I, yeah, I, I, yeah that, I love Sleepy Hollow. I yeah. I, I, I love Sleepy yeah. Hollow, but I don't know that that has the depth that you guys are, are looking for though. Ed Wood definitely has more depth, but I think in terms I think of like it does. everything Tim Burton, I think it was probably Sleepy Hollow. It's, it was, yeah, it was like a return to his sort of style, right? And stylistic of nature. Yeah. And then the another thing that just has a, a bad effect and it had a bad effect on all the industry is just CGI. Yeah. suddenly everything just becomes cgi and it's it's cost effective right when you're trying to shoot things and shoot around things but take this movie for example as as sean was saying like the nuances of the models and, and everything it's like i forgot watching it you know the other day i was like i forgot how cool it is when you're watching it with all the models and when the bat wing is going up in the air and it falls back and then it, like a lot of that was like modeling versus like strong cgi just takes away from the moment you're like oh crap you know look at what uh what's the one with um uma thurman it's just oh, so it's much around. it's yeah. so much that you're just like you're drowning in that sort of like style well, you know that's jill Sch- schumacher's gay yeah. batman yeah gay batman series <laughs> gay <It's Batman>. a- <laughs> well yeah because everyone had nipples and like yeah you know, is that yeah. why you say it's called gay batman i never noticed these things well, they well have, like, i mean, uh, J- I mean and just, the nipples like it like you uh, don't what you don't see that uh, at all. well Ju- joel shoe i mean I, I we were mentioning it earlier before you came in that joel, joel shoemaker was in narnia at that point now he's out you know he's out yeah. and about now sort of thing but if, I mean, if you look at his work i mean it's very very gay friendly yeah mm-hmm. 
you know, I mean, I have I you ever been thinking in those well, terms. Let, even, well, even look at well, Ivy. Let's put, let's so put Ivy, it, let's put it this Ivy way. Let's... goes and transforms into this like beautiful, voluptuous, you know, like woman, and yeah. like is very sultry. That's that's like yeah. Yeah, but I mean, if you look at Jill Shaymaker, let's take Lost Boys for instance, right? Right. Take the girl in Lost Boys, right? Yeah. How often does the camera gaze on the female in that movie? That's true. <laughs> like two seconds. That's true. <laughs> I never. Oh, I don't think of I these things. It doesn't matter it's, if it's, it's a director or straight director. He's well, I mean, and, and let's you know, put it this way: you know, it spends a lot of time gazing across Jason Patrick throughout the whole movie. Yeah, well, a lot much. of people were gazing at Jason Patrick throughout the whole movie. Yeah, but what? But what I'm saying. Not dead. But but but, but, yeah, but no. But what I'm saying is is that look at what the movie's aimed for look what it's aimed at sort of thing right gotcha. and the, and to be honest it's you know it, it was aimed for the the cineplex straight market sort of yeah. thing right. but yeah. but when you look at a simple fact that the female is taking a back seat in the whole movie she did and, and look, i often wondered why but, that was you know, yeah. but, if you, but, but if you if you look even if you look at even if you look at um um his poison ivy film you know sort of thing the thing is it it, it portrays poison ivy as this beautiful drag queen coming out i mean she's yeah. pretty much you know she's not a female sort of drag, yeah. but but if you look at it the movie is more focused on gazing and beautifully modifying you know robin yeah almost the whole movie you know, yeah. something, you know there's a lot of things like you know it's like batman's fighting in the background but we got you know we got robin center stage all the way through <laughs> yeah like, yeah that was i'm gonna have to go back and watch this now too. yeah now i'm but gonna I have mean, to watch it with my gaydar on i, 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 I was i was <laughs> but, but let's put it, it this way boys. even it, but even with the we even when he introduces batgirl she's i mean he's introducing batgirl who should be one of the main reasons why we're watching this film because he's introduced her she's still sidelined for yeah. robin yeah <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, I, was, I, was yeah. I guess you're your right i never really thought of that before i guess we spend I more guess. time uh, gazing on shirtless saxophone player in the Lost Boys than we do on the on uh, on the girl. Yeah, you're right. I <laughs> That's true. I that. forgot about the shirtless saxophone. The shirtless guy. saxophone yeah. guy. We spend more time he, looking at him. Well, you we also forget about Honor. Uh, you also forget about Arnold and him being very buff and like wearing his little robe and like, come on, you don't see that at all, Nikki. Come on. <laughs> Close up of Clooney's I know, butt. but I don't think of those things if if, if it's a straight or no. I mean, think about at, the think about the right? character. I guess think about the character of Victor Freeze. He's not like a, you know, he's a scientist, gentleman, kind of nerdy, geeky guy yeah. that you know turns into Freeze. Right? He's right. not a big buff dude who is like, I'm going to have some girls on my side. You know, he's literally <laughs> like. <laughs> doing a little ditty what's a ditty he does um the jingle that he does i'm like what? I'm mr white christmas i'm mr snow yeah, yeah. I'm mr. <laughs> white christmas. oh that's right I'm i mr. forgot snow. about that hello you know it's vicky <laughs> i but, forgot i forgot but if you but if you look at all joel schumacher's films they all have that in common yeah. Sort of thing. Well, so, now that I think so, about it, I know. But I yeah. She's gonna go back and be like, "Oh my god!" I'm gonna go but, back and look now. I'll just YouTube all those scenes. It's like, okay. Well, I do know saxophone that, but, guy. Saxophone guy got a lot of attention. Robin did get a lot of attention. I'll have to mm -hmm. admit, but I just didn't think about that stuff. Yeah. But saying that with Joel Schumacher, I mean, he is a good director. I mean, I will yeah. give him that. I mean, he's an know, excellent director. He's an excellent yeah. director, but there is he does have that in common with everything. I mean, I didn't notice it. I didn't notice it too much at the time, but I think he, I think he he came out of the closet when he did Phantom his version of Phantom of the Opera, which is an excellent film, actually. If you look the way it's filmed and the way he what actually film was that, yeah. Keith, Phantom, Phantom, of the Opera. Phantom of the Opera with Gerald Butler and oh, Emily yeah. Robson from um what's she do? Ah, Emily crazy. Robson's Shameless. on that show. Shameless. Uh, shameless. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And but I have to sit there and say she sings she sings a hell of a lot better than Sarah Brightman does. She doesn't squawk like she did. Yeah, but yeah. um but when you see his version of that and how beautiful that is and stuff like this, and that's when he kind of came out. And then when you start, then you re after he came out, then I started rewatching his other stuff, you know, and then it, it does become a lot of evidence. I mean, you don't really notice it the first time around, but it's like, once you know something, it's like, you just can't unsee it. Yeah. It's kind of a shame that Schumacher is kind of like synonymous with schlock because of Batman and Robin, because he made, uh, like, I think eight millimeter falling down eight mm -hmm. millimeter. Eight millimeter yeah. for a movie that's not a horror movie is one of the most terrifying movies yeah. I've ever seen. It's not movie. a horror film. That's yeah. a movie that just makes you feel dirty watching it. Yeah, that's that's a movie's yeah. 
eight millimeter, eight millimeter, millimeter. with Nicholas Cage. Oh, and Nicholas Cage. That's that movie is just wrenching. I have never that movie is really good. It's an excellent film. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I argued with somebody over it a while back, and I I I, I think that movie was just amazing. It's and it was scary, and it was it was it was uh it was scary, but not in a horror way. But it was a horrifying movie. It t- it takes you to a dark place in yourself a because very you dark want place. to see Nicolas Cage not just kill these people. You want to see him fucking torment these people them. and annihilate them. Yeah, it takes you onto the dark ride with it, which I which is I what why I think it's I personally think it's Schumacher's best movie. But I know people are going to disagree. I didn't know on he that. directed that. That movie's been and this is. Again, this is all subjective, guys. You can think any. You can yeah. think I'm completely off base here, but I love eight <laughs> millimeter because I think it actually achieves everything it, it aims to do. You flip a coin between that and falling down, and it's yeah. for the exact same reasons. The I, that I don't feel like I relate to the Michael Douglas character and falling down as much. I don't relate to the character of Michael. I Douglas, do. But I, do. I, I totally <laughs> relate to Michael Douglas. I would I like relate- to get an RPG and go to. Not Cards to that extent, no but I everyone, everyone's had a bad day <laughs> while sitting in traffic. Everyone's had yeah. that day in Grand Road Rage. Where, <laughs> road Rage, where you just and you go off and have that little fantasy, and then you get that courtesy beep behind you. Oh, okay, I got to drive. Everyone has that little moment. This guy went a little bit more than just- He just had a fantasy. bad day. Sort of he like- a bad day. Sort of like fired. the movie Unhinged, where, you know, Russell Crowe- I was oh just- Oh my God. That up. <laughs> You're talking about having a fucking bad day. That is the- Biggest bad day out of all the bad days is unhinged. So, yeah. I mean, show and showmaker. I mean, you eat a Tigerland as well. That's him. And yeah. phone booth. His phone booth. I mean, taking Colin Farrell and just keeping him in a phone booth the whole time. Yeah, I mean, but that was a yeah. movie. Yeah. Making a riveted. And of course, what? Sutherland. And he's and also Jules Schumacher took the um, basically the Brat Pack or and basically turned them into adults with Saint Elmo's Fire. Yeah, yeah. There's that too. So I don't think I've ever actually seen Phone Booth though. Phone Booth is good. I gave it. I, I mean, the thing is, for a 90 minute film and basically about a man trapped in a phone booth, booth is yeah. one of the most tense films, and you got to be very, very talented to pull that off. I think it was uh, Larry yeah. Cohen wrote that, right? I think yeah. so. Yeah. I, think, I, I thought that was that one up. of those films that I was going to hate, but I couldn't stop watching it. Mm-hmm. So. But then he's able to give that wonderful gaze on Colin Farrell through the whole movie, isn't he? <laughs> you guys are just reading way too much into this. Mm, trust me, when you when you when you go and rewatch his films, you will see the general. Well, I get, well, I get up, it so. about the Lost Boys. That one I get. But I'm gonna have to go back and watch Robin just a little bit more. I'm gonna probably well, watch a lot of them over again. Go back to Saint. Go back to Saint Elmo's Fire. I love that. Uh, Ellie, <laughs> <laughs> Ali CD, Mayor Winningham, and Debbie Moore. Not a look in. Yeah. Rob Lowe. Yeah. The, the, the guy who always looks constipated, and <laughs> McCarthy. He always looks constipated in everything he does. And mm-hmm. Judd Nelson, pretty much our center stage the whole time. Mm-hmm. You know, we even get, you know, Rob Lowe, you know, pretending he's playing saxophone for like t- five, six minutes in the film with no shirt on. You're like, okay. But you would use later for Lost Boys. Well, yeah. he knows what women want, okay? And apparently yeah. men. But apparently yeah. men. Well, well, men. Gay men. No better gay than men. a gay man with women are going to want to look at. That's all I got to say. So there. He's and, looking out for us. And he, and, he, and, he does, and he does tend to paint the boys in a lot of his movies looking like they're from gay porno. So that's, that's yeah. leaving it there sort of thing. But um, well, I'm gonna going to have to and, keep that in mind from now on. But going back to Tim Burton a little bit, I mean, yeah, I was really into Tim Burton, and, and I do, I do like this Batman film for retro sake because it does hold a period when I was used to be like a huge Burton fan, so it does so hold watch that it for me. HD. But the only the only problem I would basically find with him is that I don't. I wonder if he does struggle with emotional depth anyway, to a certain yeah. degree, because. Yeah. Um, I know Sleepy Hollow does for me does have emotional death, but I also think that has to do with the cast of characters that he put in that movie that kind well, of look at the that comics. Movie. There's not a lot of warm fuzzy in any of the comics either. I think it's just an imbalance. There, there's of- a lot. There's a lot of warm fuzzy not, there's oh, a man, lot of depth maybe. there's right. a lot of depth but there's a lot of depth in the batman comics yeah. anyway I would batman also is say- probably one of your most psychologically in-depth yeah. series. I would I've also never say it's, I've it's- never thought 
in my experience with comic books that they were that emotional. Charged. No, there's a lot of emotional tone. I think there's just an imbalance of tone with this because you have a very strong Joker and a kind of mediocre Bruce, not Batman, yeah. Bruce. Bruce is my biggest problem with it because Michael That's Keaton a didn't play a really job. good job playing Bruce because yeah, as you'll see in the next film, yeah. there's such a diversity with that yes. he gives us and that character of Bruce and Batman. Whereas this is like, you kind of just are like, yeah, 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 Bruce, bye. Where's Batman? Because <laughs> you're like, he just had, he had no, um, he played billionaire. Yeah. He played billionaire. That was they like the depth really of it. They didn't really give him a whole lot to go on as Bruce Wayne. They no, didn't. but they didn't play him like billionaire playboy. They didn't play, like, I just felt like it was a little bit like, it was, you he know. Kinda was, he's kind of boring middle-aged man with a lot of money. Yeah, that's exactly what he's, I got out of it. Yeah, He's constantly overshadowed, even in, even in the next movie. I, I, yeah. On the marketing to this, Nicholson, Nicholson is got top billing. Yeah. 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 yeah, Nicholson, Keaton, Batman. Uh, and even in the next movie, he's overshadowed by, by Michelle Pfeiffer, Danny DeVito, and Christopher Walken. Yeah, I mean, had, that was a real that was a real cornucopia of casting, though. You know, well, Batman's always had that problem in the early in the nineties with his the villains overshadowing him. It's the yeah. same thing in Batman uh, Begin or not Batman Begins. Uh, uh, Batman and Robin. Schwartz Batman and Robin is first. Yeah. Before it though, Jim Carrey and Tommy Lee Jones. They're so over the top there, and you have Val Kilmer, who's very subdued, very timid. Yeah. And it and it wasn't really until the Nolans that they gave the the character a little bit more respect to more meat, yeah. That's yeah, true. Meat to, you know, uh, yeah, I, I mean, just that. also like depth of like going at, through the explorations of becoming what he's become, right? I just feel like they almost play this film as if he is two different people and they're trying to trick you. Like, right, like you get to see Bruce and you get to see Batman and and you don't know, right, until and then there's that moment of, oh, it's, it's you know, we know because we know the story, but it's as if they're trying to like, okay, I wonder if anyone's ever seen or read anything about Batman because if they have it, we can like trick them, right, because it feels like they're trying to keep these two personas separate. And be like, oh, let's see if people, you know, are going to figure that out. And I'm like, why? I mean, pretty much everyone on the planet knows who Batman is. <laughs> it's like, do you think I that Christopher, think Christopher, do you think that Christopher, the, the, but, but at this point, Superman had something to do with that, though? Because you had that to come out, and that was very popular. And they, yeah, they, but, they well, they concentrated on Clark Kent, though, a lot. Well, I'm trying they, to understand know, the I, dynamic. I, I, but see, that's where I think there's a difference between the original Superman with the, Chris, the original Christopher Reeves Superman, because yeah. I think you had a director who was paying homage and loved the Superman yeah. because he grew up with it. He was a huge yeah. Superman fan. Yeah. Here, Tim Burton, I think he dipped his toes in Super, um, Batman, but I don't think he was a huge lover of it. I mean, by the time yeah. he did Batman Returns, he said he never wanted to touch it. He never wanted to see another super right. Batman thing ever again. He never wanted to touch it. Yeah. But what I will say, if we didn't have this Batman, we wouldn't have Batman animated series where we do get the in-depth Batman yeah. and all the other stuff that comes with it. I agree. And, so this, so, yeah. and this is probably one of the only times that a film is actually given well, no, I guess we get that with Buffy as well where yeah. we get a film that's okay. It does well. It does what it's supposed to do. But then we get a TV series that actually gives it a hell of a lot more meat and a hell of a lot, lot more pathos to go along with it and then in this case we get the animated series which if it wasn't for you know but tim burton's batman we wouldn't have the look of the animated series which helped lift it into a new level well, of animation anyway so well, as far as the mainstream though the 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 earlier uh iterations of batman they never even delved into who who he is, his parents, and all that stuff. Here, it doesn't doesn't go that in depth, but here we we see his parents being killed when he was a young kid. Because in the '60s, Batman, Adam West is just a millionaire who's taking in this uh, this his young ward, and that's it. We don't get any don't other. I, I don't why he's a ward. They, 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 he's just there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, we 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 know we know that there's Anne Harriet and Alfred, and we don't know anything about what happened to Bruce's parents. Right. We just. Who knows? Not in the it, old series. You didn't know shit. Well, but I think the old that. series too. They kind of stayed away from the cob, right? You're like, even with your fighting villains, it it's really hard to like do damage to a villain and not be violent. <laughs> it 
<laughs> like and that, that, this, uh, the series was right, like, right. let's spray him with the gas and it knocks him out. You know, it's like you can't shoot, you know, like you can't well, shoot. Well, they did have the pow. Remember the pow, wham, snap, Yeah, but I mean, it was still loud. very cartoon comic. You had to keep everything. Yeah. So you're not going to be and like, every a, and, and every once in a while, they would have to died. do a bad dance. <laughs> Shot down to <laughs> death. Juicy. <laughs> Every once in a while, they have to do the pony in the middle of it, you know, yeah. <laughs> and a little bit of a shimmy in the wave yeah. and the surf. Oh my god, but, yeah. Uh, but um, I also have to think that maybe also, like in 1989, there wasn't a lot of emotional depth in films anyway. Really, I mean, we had Dead Poets Society that had death. Probably the most in-depth film oh that god, had a lot of emotional resonance was when Harry met Sally and probably The Little Mermaid. Right. You know, this is yeah. all within 1989, but there. You know, but you had like Uncle Buck and Papa, you know, and things Uncle like that. But there, in Indiana Jones, there's all kind of a lot of spectacle, big block off, which is kind of where we kind of gone to today with the whole Marvel thing. It's all kind of a lot of spectacle and a lot of sight, but there's not a lot of depth going on. Yeah. So Batman's probably a product more of that as well, that, we, you know, we are going to go to the multiplex and we want to see the spectacle of everything. And Batman does deliver on that. Yeah. Oh, def- you know. it definitely delivers on the spectacle. So. Until he starts hating on Superman. <laughs> I, I kind of feel like this movie kind of also had a little subtle passing of the torch of the, the um, you know, the scary villain actor kind of went from Jack Palance to, to, uh, to Jack Nicholson in this because Palance was the guy who was the, 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 the gruff badass in so many movies. And it was in the 80s that kind of Nicholson just kind of started kind of taking over that and, and he would do it for a little while it's it's really cool to see them in a scene together too I yeah we got more jack palance though in a way we do get more of him later in later stuff i mean if because of, i think it's because of batman we kind of get city slickers don't we so yeah they kind of like led to a resurgence so. for him oh um actually um robert zadar when i worked uh, when i worked with him uh because he went and made tango and cash with uh, with Jack Palance and Sylvester Stallone after this, and this is just how intimidating Jack Palance was as just uh, just as a human being. Um, Zadar told me this story. They were sit, uh, they they were all together somewhere like a diner or something during uh, during one of the, the meal periods because they were going to be shooting something there later. He says like this diner there are all these mirrors. Like if you're sitting there, just if you're looking over here like this looking at the wall, you, you could see what's behind you. But Jack Palance was sitting alone and he was eating with his back to everybody, but he was keeping an eye on the mirror so he could see what everyone was doing. And uh, apparently there was this one PA um, that uh, Robert Zadar said, yeah, this kid was really excited. He's like, oh my God, I get to work with Jack Palance. I, I love Jack Palance so much. I really want to talk to him, but he's kind of intimidating. And Robert Zadar and Sylvester Stallone and all those guys, I guess to kind of just, just kind of mess with the kid go, Go talk to him. He's really, he's really, he's really super cool. Go talk to him. It's like, really? You think you no, no, go, go. And they're all sitting there snickering. As this kid walks over and he he's timidly go, Mr. Mr. Palance. And the way Zadar describes it, Jack Palance is eating and he just kind of looks up and looks at the mirror and looks at the kid through the mirror. And he just looks up at him. And the kid's like still intimidated. He goes, I I've seen. Every one of your movies, I absolutely love you. You're my favorite actor. And Palance never looking up, never standing up, just looking at him in the mirror. Goes, you've seen all my movies? He goes, yeah, I've seen every one of your movies. Palance gets up, stands and looks at him and goes, name him. The kid's like, <laughs> wait, what? Goes, you said you've seen all my movies. On the spot. Not, not intimidating at all, not one bit. <laughs> And he's like Stallone and uh, Zadar and all those guys are just cracking up because it looks like this kid's just shitting himself. And Jack Palance like, you said you've seen all my movies. Name them. All of them. Like, and- <laughs> space just- 1999. <laughs> <laughs> was he in Space 1999? Yeah. He Interestingly enough, Jack no, Palance that is... Uh, oh, that was Martin Landau. Sorry. Yeah. Jack Palance's daughter is actually Drusilla from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Oh, how funny. Yeah. And who's actually Jodie Foster's ex girlfriend. Really? Really? Didn't I, know that. I didn't know. Yeah. I didn't know his kids went into acting. Yeah. Well, no, sorry. No, I take that back. That's Julie. It's Lant- Martin Landau. That Jack Palance. I'm getting it mixed <laughs> up. Sorry. <laughs> right. Keith's starting the rumor mill oh, already. No. <laughs> 
I'm never going to be able to name any Jack Palance films. <laughs> Jack Palance was really <laughs> great as Bella Lugosi in, Ed, in Tim Burton's Ed Wood. Yeah, sorry, I'm getting them mixed up, aren't I? No, no, Juliet Landau and Martin Landau's <laughs> did look alike. daughter, who is Jodie Foster in, in the world's face. So, yeah, sorry. They no. did look and, alike. Martin Landau and Jack Pounce did look alike. So I, I totally don't blame you for that one. And I also think because Martin Landau did a lot of films with um, Tim Burton, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. I, I was just yeah. making the joke that, yeah, Jack Pounce is great as, as Bella Lugosi and Ed Wood. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm getting, I'm getting slightly confused. So. Yeah, it happens. I get people confused all the time. Yeah, so as see. my old as my old age takes me over, what we're gonna do now? <laughs> we'll talk about Batman Begins before I dig myself in a bigger ditch, <laughs> which is a 2005 superhero film directed by Christopher Nolan and written by Nolan and David S. Goyer. The film is based on DC Comics character Batman. It stars Christian Bale as Bruce Wayne slash Batman, Michael Caine, Liam Neeson, Katie Holmes, Gary Oldman, Killian Murphy, Tom Wilkinson, Rupert Howard. Ken Watabe and Morgan Freeman in supporting roles. The film reboots the Batman film series, telling the origin story of Bruce Wayne from the death of his parents to his journey to becoming Batman and his fight to stop Ra'al al Ghul and the Scarecrow from plunging Gotham City into chaos. Um, after Batman and Robin, that pretty much was panned by critics and underperformed at the box office. It pretty much killed the franchise until Christopher Nolan decided that he would like to bring give it a give it a try but before that a studio did reject a batman origin story which was rebooted by josh whedon who was riding high from buffy at that time in De december 2002 but warner brothers decided to hire nolan in january 2003 to direct a new film as miller and goyer have begun development on the film in early 2003 they were aiming for a darker more realistic tone compared to the previous films a primary goal for the revision was to engage the audience to emotional investment in both the batman and bruce Wayne's identities of the lead characters so what we're going to do is going to cut to the trailer of Batman Begins. I'll be right back. Tell us, Mr. Wayne. What do you fear? How do you know my name? The world is too small for someone like Bruce Wayne to disappear. Your parents' death was not your fault. My parents deserve justice. I cannot let that pass. If you make yourself more than just a man, then you become something else entirely. Which is? A legend, Mr. Wayne. Master Wayne, are you coming back for long, sir? As long as it takes to show the people of Gotham their city doesn't belong to the criminals and the corrupt. Bruce? Rachel? You were gone a long time. I know. Things are worse than ever down here. What chance does Gotham have when the good people do nothing? No make survival suit for advanced infantry. Careful law utility harness, gas-powered magnetic grapple gun. What's that? You want the tumbler? Oh, you wouldn't be interested in that. I spent a lot of time being scared for you. When I heard you were back. But the man I loved. The man who vanished never came back. He's here. Who? The Batman. God, that must be destroyed. Gotham isn't beyond saving. Just hold on! Rachel! Guy dresses up like a bat clearly has issues. <laughs> Hello, welcome back to Literary Life's Podcast. We're discussing Batman Begins from 2005 and talking to Sean. What are your views of Batman Begins? Batman Begins was a really interesting reintroduction to the character after the 
the Joel Schumacher era. Um, I remember when I saw it for the first time, it was what jumped out at me was Christian Bale, who I, I, I remember at the time thinking that he would be a perfect Bruce Wayne. And I was basing that off of his performance in American Psycho, strangely enough. Uh, yeah. I thought he's very good at playing that that yuppie character, which you yeah. kind of you kind of need to be to play a good Bruce Wayne. You have to put on a good false face. And uh, he was one of the few people that I, I but I was shocked that he was doing it because he was d- constantly dropping weight and, and putting weight on and dropping weight and putting weight on. And this was For this one. He had a problem with his weight going up and down, too. Well, because they doing, thought he was too fat. The then he wasn't fat as- no, but I also <laughs> think the mechanics, he had to lose a lot of weight before this. Because wasn't he mechanics yeah. was, before, which he dropped yeah. a lot of weight. In it was that. either before or after. But yeah, going yeah. To, to between one to the and he had to get more. And buff. by the way, he's still true to this day because he did this for for Thor. He dropped yeah. a lot of weight to play that sure. character. So. And it's 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 really uh, it's a really interesting performance from from Christian Bale because we get the bat voice and mm-hmm. it, it, and that's kind of become a meme at this point. But <laughs> uh, aside from that, I, I don't know. I, it's just the knowing the comics the way I did because I had gotten more into them at that point. I kind of knew the red herring going into it with Ken Watanabe and and uh, Liam Neeson and it's if you can get if you didn't know that and if you didn't realize it then you can kind of really enjoy the movie i remember it taking it was taking me out of it because i'm just like when's liam showing up i know liam's showing up this is it's he's gonna come back well and, you also have the batman animated series that kind of has this all going on at the same time well. prior to that so yeah they, have de- mm-hmm. they definitely educated the audience a lot more in that time but the thing i was looking out for the most was uh i remember uh Around that time, Darren Aronofsky was in the running to possibly do a reboot of Batman, very similar to the Matt Reeves version, a lot more stripped down. Uh, He wouldn't have a a Batmobile. It'd be more like a a Corvette or a Trans Am with a jet engine on the back. It was going to be a lot more gritty based off of year one, uh, the year one comic. And and that was kind of, uh, so when I went into this, I was expecting a little bit more rawness. I didn't realized that we were going to get kind of a a mob story at first uh, mixed in with this whole uh mystical backstory and the, it with with the with the gas and then you get a little bit of corporate espionage with Rug- Rugger Hauer it was it had it all it had mm-hmm. everything in it and the yeah. that you don't get and it coming from Joel Schumacher and Tim Burton it felt like okay you're grown-ups now it's been 15 yeah. years. We can right. start treating you like grown-ups. Let's let's give you an adult Batman because this comic at at its core is really for older kids and adults. Yeah. So yeah. Well, I have to, yeah, go ahead, I, Keith. I have to turn and say that thank God. I mean, I do like Christopher Nolan film a lot. I'm not so much that I, you yeah. know, I'm a fanboy, but I do love his films, but I they thank God they had a director who was able to balance everything because there's a lot going on in this movie and everyone, every story yeah. is very, very well drawn out and able to be put together. And this is huge jigsaw puzzle that comes together fantastically well. Yeah. You know, to bring an origin ah. story. And then, I mean, and we got pretty much three villains going on at the same time here. Yeah. But each of these villain stories are very, very well drawn out. And we don't normally, we don't normally get that in a second or third version of any of these superhero films. And he's able to do this in the first one that's introduced this and able to balance all that. And you do get the, and this does have the emotional resonance through it. You do feel what he's going through and what he needs to do and why, you know, and you get, you know, I mean, the only, the only downside I I have about this is Michael Caine as Alfred. Really? I liked it. I liked him. Yeah, I think he's I okay. But the, the problem the problem with him is that basically this is Michael Caine doing Cider House Rules. So it's like yeah. I just like, yeah. I just I kind of expect him to be doing abortions for all the um, poor people in the town. <laughs> Stop <later>. it. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> but, but, um, Damn. The Night yeah. Prince of Gotham. Come to way, yeah. Mana. I can give you a coat hanger. <laughs> so, but, but, um, coat, of course. But but I I and the thing is I think Michael Caine does a good job. Yeah. But for some reason is that 
when you saw Michael Goff in the previous thing, and then when you see the Alfred character in the animated series, just from having, and the thing is, we don't really get a lot of Alfred backing story at all, really. You yeah. know, you kind of, <clears throat> but yeah, I guess. when Michael Caine, for some reason, he didn't seem like he came up with any backing story. And the other ones, even yeah. though there's no backing story, you just felt like there's a backing story there and you believed in it. And yeah. Michael Caine kind of <clears throat> felt like, we got we got, we got an Academy Award winning actor here. Yay. <laughs> kind of yeah. felt like that. And he's English. He has an English accent. Even though he doesn't have an English accent, he's got pretty much a common East End accent. That's what Michael Caine is. Um, yeah. I like Michael Caine as an actor. I guess he there's kept the things upset I, kind of Kind of whenever, you know. I guess Christian Bale fell asleep. You know that scene where he's been drugged and he wakes up the next morning, you know, after yeah. he gets gassed and stuff. Yeah, Apparently, yeah. he actually fell asleep while he was waiting for... Uh, oh, that's for in the yeah. car or so actually Michael, no, on the Michael bed? Cain. No, oh. in bed. It was the bed scene. Yeah. And he came over and apparently Michael Caine was poking him in the ribs saying, what do you, what do you sleep? Wake up. Wake up. <laughs> I, think, I don't know. I got a kick out of that little thing. I think what is brilliant about this isn't that by itself is an amazing movie to me, in my opinion. I but love it. the three of the movies together are so well written. Like I actually have went through them over and over and over again. And it's as it's as if there was so much thought put into it that from the very beginning they knew they the growth of the characters from beginning to end. Because right, when you get to even right. where Alfred is in the last movie, there's such a, I'm done with your shit. Either yeah. grow the fuck up or die, right? Like he's just like done. And this, yeah. he is playing the father figure to someone who is just really lost and kind of trying to help him find his way and just trying to be a leading hand. So I I kind of, you know, for me that his role was sort of that and it, and it summed up enough for me. I think, um, it's also hard to balance a cast of characters that are so strong. Scarecrow. Exactly. They're all tight. You have, you, have you know, yeah. Liam Neeson, who, you know, was it, AKA Roz. It's like, you have these characters that are like so strong characters trying to balance it out. The only one that I <laughs> thought was very flat was Katie Holmes. Yeah. It was uh, kind actually, of flat. Actually, and you're right, John. Extremely I, I actually, confusing I actually liked when her. I moved to the second movie because I was like, "Oh, it's the same girl." Because I remember the first time watching the second movie, I love going, Katie Holmes too. "Wait, how does she know him? And who is?" She? And then I, at one point, my characters. friend was like, "It's She's Rachel Dawes," and I was like, "They should have put a hey, this is Rachel Dawes," because I was completely. I forgot how that was. It just Katie Holmes couldn't couldn't do the second one. Was I, that yeah, the second I think one? they just were like, we're gonna we we have to continue with that Ooh. character, and we just will move on. Yeah, which which I wish they were probably gotten. dealing with her yeah. Scientologist husband. No, stuff. they asked they they asked Kate. No, they asked Katie Holmes to come back, but at that point there was a there was a problem with um her divorcing. She was, she was oh, going okay. through her divorcing oh, okay. at that time. Yeah. But I mean, oh, they picked no. Maggie, Maggie, Maggie Gyllenhaal, which I love subsequently in the second right. film. I just felt like Katie Holmes was. Um, I would have liked was, to see her do more. She was, you know, trying to be mm. this strong, you know, character DA, you know, eventually that it just didn't feel it felt like everyone else grew up like Bruce grew up. Right. He oh, was maybe. like, you can picture the college Bruce. Right. And then by the end of his, you know, his transformation, you can see he's grown up in these different layers to himself. Her, you can, she you just can only didn't... act as good as you're written for, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's well, true. To be honest, I kind of disagree with Katie Holmes. I thought I, I liked her in this because I think oh, this I is the her, first time. I thought she could have been well, stronger. I, well, yeah. I'm, I'm thinking that I think for me, and this is probably the first time in a superhero film that you had a decent female that basically had a good storyline. Right, normally yeah. they're just they're normally they're just eye candy and i mean right gwyneth well, Pal yeah. paltrow and iron man i mean she's kind of like just there as pepper he's kind of like okay <laughs> it's like what are you doing yeah. she's like you know she's nag like the nagging wife that's not really married <laughs> she's yeah, doing that. Those that i never got anything from her i was i was always like she just kind of feel she's in how, how many movies in that universe and yeah. Yeah, right. I always got the vibe movie. like she she'll do them, but don't don't write too much for me. I'll be in your movie. Just don't write. Yeah, me put me too here. Much. Put me. Oh, I've dude. never been a big. I'll do a scene with Robert. I'll do a scene with. I'll do a scene with John. Paycheck. That's about yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. What, 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 what has she what, done what that's like Oscar okay, material? Cool. Has she done anything outstanding? Yeah, Shakespeare, Shakespeare in Love and Sliding Doors and Elizabeth. And uh, no, be before she before she married Chris, uh, um, Coldplay, boring guy. You know, she she did she did quite well, and then she kind of married him, and kind of. 
dropped off. My mom I mean, loves she, the crapper. Okay, she, she does. A, she does a lot of the films by. Um, I don't the follow Royal Ten, much. the Royal Tenenbaums. Fantastic movie. Yeah, really good. You know, um, and I don't the, follow her as films. much. She's got but, the goop industry at this point, and that's kind of what she's doing for the. She's the been doing the vagina candles. She's doing the goop. No, can you imagine goop. what that day at work was like? <laughs> Coming up yeah. with the name goop. goop. No, no. Do these candles smell like my vagina? Oh <laughs> my god! God. Like, oh, god. Wait, no. god. She did. Well, she does vagina candles. I can have we, not personally. Can we go one. back to talking about Gotham for a second? <laughs> Jesus <laughs> Christ! So Sorry, the other John, the other you thing can but, handle it. the other thing that's amazing. The other thing that's amazing is is <laughs> Gotham in itself because Gotham, the the actual city is a character in itself. And it's it's sort it of is. like again, a testament to each film is testing the character of every single person that lives there. Well, it's I think all, you think it's always Chicago about Chicago too, didn't yeah, they? Yeah, they, they did. It was you a, think it's always about deal when Do you know that a drunk hit the Batmobile? A what? In a state of panic and believing that the Batman's vehicle is to be invading alien spacecraft. Yeah. Yeah, we have. <laughs> I, guess. Uh, I always dig out these little facts about stuff because there's always some weird shit out there. I was like, yeah, you have that in black. Mm-hmm. I love, I like, I love that line. You have that in black. But Gotham, Gotham in this movie is a fucking hellhole. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. More so than in the Burton movie. Like when you well, when you well, a, a part of Rachel... Gotham, right? A part of Gotham because it's the the narrows, the narrows, the narrows, yeah. which is important because, like, so as Keith was saying, how there is sort of this transformation from from film to series, animated series, right. from and from a gaming perspective, they took that same modeling and built really strong games out of this modeling right. that you have like the villains are all in Arkham and now they're not in Arkham. Now they're in a city. Like there's a section that will give to them all the, the low, you know, low lives are all there. And as long as they're there, the rest of society can be great and clean. And, and, you know, and it, I like love that. Now. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, well, well, I mean, be, I mean, it's a bit like, um, I mean, if you look at Chicago in a, in a, overview anyway chicago is like you know you do have you know homeless and people like that but they tend to be under waker avenue don't they waker drive yeah, <laughs> yeah. Waker drive. yeah, yeah and, over and, and, and so over. so so but but the thing is waker drive is basically under like you know marshall fields and all the other stuff above it sort of thing and water yeah. tower and all that well, and so you know and the thing is and this is very much a metropolis kind of view right. anyway for its yeah. metropolis where the rich mm-hmm. are living on the top and the high and the poor are very i didn't know they filmed sort of. it in chicago though till this morning actually well, yeah. Dawn, well this Dawn, uh has told me because you used to live yeah. used to live near like where the dividing line was uh for or well well not for that particular area i used what, to for the area. good side or the purge side there, the way that uh the way that chicago was laid out back before um cabrini green the infamous cabrini green from the Candyman movies right the way where those projects were is right next to literally within a thousand feet uh some of the highest real estate in the city it's right the city, at the yeah, heart yeah. of the loop and it's it's it, you, it's literally one of those things you go across an l track and suddenly you're in the Gold Coast. They've been wow, gentrifying yeah. the area for a lot for the last 20 years, but it was back in the, around this time. No kidding, did not know it, that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I lived in Chicago in 1987 and I lived in Printer's Row, yeah. South okay. Loop. And, you know, the thing is, is like you have the 50s style McDonald's, but if you went on the other side of the 50s, <laughs> McDonald's, oh, yeah. oh spaghetti. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. It's still like that. There's, there's areas of Evanston mm-hmm. Where there's uh, there's the there's the area that's um, uh, basically run by Northwestern University, and that area is all clean and beautiful. But you literally, like Sean says, you literally cross the tracks to the other side. Lower income houses, lower income, lower income areas. It's like here in Dallas too. Same. I I think that's I think that every major city has that. London has it as well. Houston is a total shithole. If you've ever been there. Oh my God. I well, feel like that's I mean, what but, the moral of this whole story though, too, is yeah. like the reset, right? As that's Roz right. is trying to do. And like that, that in itself, I remember watching that film that's was a good like, point too, Jim. that's, that's pretty nefarious, but at the same Theory. time, I could see how an organization's like, we're going to do a full reboot and cause something really bad to happen. It'll just reset. We'll just build it back yeah. the way we want it. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Right. And that's, that's what Raz al Ghul is basically doing here. Yeah, that's his. That's his. His intention is we're yeah. gonna make it. 
doing again because he's done it multiple times. He's well, like, well, we didn't did hear, we didn't hear. You know? And Bane carries it forward in Dark Knight Rises. Yeah, it's, it's yep. a carry the League of Shadows. That's the League of Shadows. The the I game. think the the second one is amazing because it's it is almost the totality of the human nature of who, who we are and what we're capable of. And so the Joker, you know, Heath Ledger, I mean, that that was like, it. You, like I just remember watching it going, wow, it does yeah. challenge the mind. You are the person, what you're capable of doing for whatever that reason. That was an unusual movie, The Joker. But it was so good. I mean, I mean, then you get into Joaquin Phoenix, who's similarly. Well, it wasn't, it was nothing wasn't. like anything we'd ever seen. No, Joker. no. It was a totally yeah. different ball game. Yeah. because he was more about show i think the comic book version of the joker was all about show and pomp and circumstance and this was blows things up and just walks and, away yeah. with yeah. the entire yeah. and brimstone yeah. Him. yeah well he he made or he didn't make he challenged people to make the choice for themselves would you do right this or would you do that right and you know there are consequences but what are you going to do right. you know right yeah I feel I feel like the the the, the Joaquin Phoenix Joker movie. It may, it's not not like anything we've seen in the superhero genre, but it's basically uh, Scorsese's King of Comedy and um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Taxi Driver kind of kind of yeah. combined, meshed. Mm -hmm. The Taxi yeah. Driver is that what you said? Uh, taxi Driver and uh, King of Comedy. Yeah, Robert De Niro's um, two Martin Scorsese's characters right. meshed together to make one Joaquin Phoenix for the Joker. Yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah. yeah, that's one way of looking at it, I guess. I never thought mm -hmm. of that before. And if you watch King of Comedy uh, with Robert De Niro and Jerry Lewis, you'll see a lot of similarities with Arthur with Arthur Fleck. Mm -hmm. You know that he took, a, was it a, a Christopher Nolan took them, the whole film crew, to a private screening of Blade Runner, the 1982. This is how we're going to make Batman, apparently. Oh, wow. That was the premise, yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I think what Christopher no I, I what's interesting about Christopher Nolan's Gotham City anyway is that yeah, you kind of have a Chicago overcoat which right. a lot of it shot. Yeah. But if you also notice he he did what most comic books did whether it's Metropolis or Gotham is basically he amalgamated a lot of other buildings to make it into yeah, you know, super center. Well, to make yeah. it Gotham because what do, what yeah. does Gotham mean? Sort of thing. Or what yeah. does Metropolis mean? Like so yeah. if you know if, and I think that's probably where Superman kind of gets it wrong because Superman always settles everything in New York City. For yeah. everything I don't know if like these New York guys City. will remember, but then the where, first Superman, though, I mean, uh, Batman, though, they the mayor looked like Ed Koch. Do you know who I'm talking about, Keith? In it, the 89 one, yes. He yeah. does kind of look like yeah. Ed Koch. He looks like, yeah. exactly yeah. like I Ed Koch. I never Koch. put it together. I, yeah. I don't know why I didn't think of that first sooner, but... But but the but the but the comic book but the comic book cities of Gotham City and Metropolis are basically a conglomeration of every major city in the world. Right. That's yeah, yeah. I agree so, with that. Yeah, I and then I think if Superman was going if they were going to do another Superman movie, it probably would be wise to do what Christopher Nolan has done here and what other Metropolis. people have done. Is, uh, and take New York City and pretty much record. add Chicago, add Houston, add Tokyo, add all the countries. I yeah. want to say in Batman v Superman, uh, Metropolis is because I've seen a couple of the Chicago skyscrapers in the background of the uh -huh. memorial, but I've also seen Pittsburgh and I've seen Detroit. Yeah. So I think it's like a combination of all it the cities. It is a combination of all the cities. By the way, you can get away with it because it is like a multiverse. So people are like commenting. <laughs> it's like it is part of the multiverse, you know, it could be anywhere. What? I mean, but Pittsburgh he, also is the is the city that uh, when Charles Dickens that Charles Dickens called uh, Gotham. Yeah, so it makes and it sense. It was used as Gotham in uh, uh, Dark Knight Rises. They they yeah. went to Pittsburgh to film. It wasn't Chicago. Um, the bridges blowing up though are the bridges linking Manhattan and Brooklyn. Okay, so That's it's a So yeah. there's, there's, it's there's, a combo. there's yeah, New York yeah. City in there too because he's blowing up the the Manhattan Bridge, or the, was it the Williamsburg? I thought I it was the Verrazano Nero's, but I. Was, but I I thought because those were so expensive. There's other arrows on the other side. That's that uh, that's on the other side of Brooklyn. Uh, okay, Stanton. yeah, you're right. You're right. It's been some time. But if you, but if you look at the com if you look at the comic books anyway, if you look at the b buildings that are in the background as a setting for Batman or so, yeah. you notice that you know you'll see like a, a Chicago building and then you'll see like a Tokyo and you'll see like a London yeah. building or you know and they're always that's and that's what Gotham means. It's kind of like a conglomerate. Conglomerate. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, actually really love think about it. Gotham is is Metropolis by night in a lot of these. Oh yeah, yeah. It's what Joe. Yeah. Gotham is kind of Metropolis by night if you really look at the uh, if you really look at the comics because a lot of the same buildings. It's just yeah. it's it's more it's more bright and light and shining in, in yeah. Superman. 
but in Batman, it's dark and gritty and gritty grimy. and yeah, yeah. In very industrial. Very. But, but have you ever, but have you ever noticed with um, Batman always seems to fight his crimes in the dark, and not because Superman always fights. He's not the doing day. it in the daylight. Like, that's for yeah. real. Yeah. 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 I mean, I mean, I know they do fight vice versa. Don't get me wrong, but every time I think of Superman, I always think I'm fighting during the daytime for some reason. Well, Batman also that's part of camouflage, right? You're like hiding, and how are you going to hide in bright? You're literally a big bat. Like you can't miss <laughs> a big bat in <laughs> yeah, the daytime. Yeah. <laughs> you're kind of like in the shadows aren't you but then you well, do wonder so you do wonder like during the day then why would you just commit more crimes during the day because <laughs> you're like hey he's not the amateurs go out at night well, well batman is fighting crime on the ground level whereas superman yeah. what he's but fighting he is usually monsters. something larger yeah. than global. life <laughs> like yeah global usually yeah well, he's superhuman, isn't he? That's the difference. And Batman's human, and Superman's hu superhuman. He's not. Well, he's an alien, really, isn't he? Also, Superman uh, gets most of his powers from the rays of our yellow sun. Yes. So there's yeah. that aspect of it too. He's stronger during the day. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know oh, that. Okay. I didn't know that. Um, oh, you didn't well, know that. That's how he heals. Say it. They just say he gets his power from the from the sun. Yeah, well, his son, his former planet was a red sun. It was ours, the yellow sun. So the yellow right. sun has a different effect on his species. Yeah. Gotcha. Just like if we okay. were on the on in his planet, maybe we would be super because it's a different sun, you know. And as um, mentioned, as I mentioned, animated series don't understand why he doesn't get Lois to get rid of all the kryptonite. Just don't, don't just just get rid of there. the kryptonite. I know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Away from hey, girl, it. go pick there. it all up for there. me. Yeah. Apparently, when they did this film and inspired the James Bond producers, uh, Michael Wilson and uh, Barbara Broccoli, to reboot the James Bond franchise and reinvent the character of James Bond, making him more darker and more realistic with Casino Royale. And yeah, I thought that was the Bourne movies that pushed him. It was Batman. It was Batman Begins that really pushed him. It was, that was apparently Batman that inspired them to go dark. Okay, okay. I, I would have thought it would be the Bourne. The Bourne. And you know what? I'm happy with that because Casino Royale, Skyfall are two of the best bond movies ever i yeah. still think so i still think that um craig looks like a a human potato i don't know it's just me <laughs> <laughs> a human potato oh my god he does he's got a potato head he looks like the brother he looks like the brother of the guy who used to sing for jimmy somerville who used to sing for a bronski beat and you know um, <laughs> don't leave me this way with the communards he's got, he's got, he's got a potato head <laughs> uh. <laughs> Um, I love Bruce's character in this just because um, there's a, there's a, a moment yeah. I was actually I was writing I was watching and I was I was listening to him say something in the writing for it when he decides that he can't be like he has some he, he's pretty much has to be a dick of a billionaire like he just has to be this snarky sort of like, like you know just idiot because he he knows that if he is something that's taken seriously that the focus would be on him so he would yeah. rather just play a, a well alfred told him that but, yeah well, no but i'm say, saying like that that, that that you know, scene swim is with like some models in a fountain yeah. yeah he has to pretend to be something always right so he he can't be and then i love that line towards the end when you know rachel says to him like let me know when you're back because you're you can't be who you are like you just can't and and i get you have to protect both personas because one is doing something fiscally for the for the you know for gotham right. and the other one is doing something to secure gotham and i i just love i love that that hero. little nuance is something because they could have just played him straight edge like this is who he is and this is what he is kind of sad because like batman's never gonna find love he's just not well, I mean, well, that's not he, true. He, he does have, he does have sex. Ends. He does have sex with Batgirl later on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that fucking movie. That fucking movie. <laughs> no, no, that's in the comic book series. Well, the comic book and in the games, <laughs> the video games, they do that too. Yeah. And then he does. He also have like an affair so with Batman the meets Grand Theft Auto. He has. A, he, has a he, also, he has. He also has uh, an affair with. One, um, he also has an affair with one of the Robins. He's a female Robin as well. Yeah. Carrie, yeah. Has a, a Carrie, Equity, Carrie gotta Kelly. love it. Oh, God. Yeah, yeah. I haven't read that one. <laughs> I mean, yeah. you could also get in. He get he gets a little, you know, one of Raish's daughters, you know, to, Talia. 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 Oh, yeah, Talia Damian, yeah, Wayne. Well. Damian Wayne, one yeah. of the current Robins. Is little, little baby, little baby Bruce. <laughs> little baby yeah. Bruce. But I think, I mean, I'm, I'm going to have to give, I mean, I, I think we're, um, sorry, Christian Bale, I think gives a lot of weight as well, because there's, there's something that he does that I found that I didn't really notice, but, 
You know, when like he throws everyone out of the party and the older man sits there and goes, your father be ashamed. And he's sitting there. And the thing is, he realized how good of an actor because you see it register in his eyes and his face. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah. every every little nuance is like sort of thing. Or when someone says something when he's putting Bruce Wayne or he's letting his parents down, he does have he does have a habit of doing that thing with his face that's very, very... So uh, very, very minute, but it's like yeah. you can see where he's an extremely good actor. He is yeah. an extremely good actor. I have to, I mean, I, was, I mean, maybe against Michael, uh, Mike, I like Michael Keaton, I, but to be honest, I really didn't know if Michael Keaton could act until I saw The Birdman when he did yeah. Birdman. Yeah. And then I realized what he is actually an excellent actor. But, um, and I'm kind of wondering, like, where have you been hiding all this time? But up until that point, I, I like Michael Keaton. I mean, I like Mr. Mom, I like Beetlejuice and you know, and that car, and that, that sort of. It was thing. a night but, shift with their love brokers. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I like, I love night, I like night shift as well. One of Ron Howard's better films for me. I, you know, that's that that's kind of disappeared. I love really. that movie. So, but um, but yeah, where Kristen Bale is like, I think you. I think I liked him in American Psycho, but because you didn't see too much of him. I mean, before American Psycho, for me, I saw him in Newsies. The Newsies, well, that's what everyone knows him from. Yeah, Newsies. Oh, but yeah. and and that horrible, annoying kid in Empire of the Sun. Oh, he's a little boy. <laughs> yes. in oh my god, him? I forgot about that. Oh my god, is that him? Yes. Yeah. No shit. Yeah. And I, I just remember. That. And the thing is that every time that woman started singing in the soundtrack, I think like, oh God, Julie Andrews, please shut up. <laughs> <laughs> but that that was him i mean he's, he's well he's not even english i mean he's not he's, he's welsh he's not even he's not english and he's not american but i've said to say yeah. that he's really come into his own and um and outside of his little you know thing that you know they tried to destroy him when we needed terminator when um basically he yelled out the crew that got filmed yeah he's, yeah. he's kind of taken like kind of a back step a little bit and it's kind of ashamed really because yeah. you know i think i think we got you know, if we're going to name some of the greatest actors of our time, I think Kristen Bale is kind of going to be there at some yeah, point. Absolutely. He yeah. he is good at like I think they trust him to take a moment to improv because there's moments within this film you could tell they just let him like just let him do. <laughs> it's the same with Nicholson. I'm sure at the same point with the Joker, like he's doing him, and like there's there's moments where you're like, I'm sure they were just like let the camera roll. Just right. whatever we get, great. Whatever we don't, we'll can. But like, there, there, there's just these like moments with him where you could tell, like he says, he has this like subtlety in the way he looks at something and does something, and how he gauges um, fear. Like you know, this whole movie, a lot of it is about fear and knowing your fear and facing your fear and all that. And there was just a way of like, how do you do that without overacting, right? Like there's moments where you're like, oh, you can be very overacting into fear, but like you can tell he's mastering this level of fear, just how he portrays it in the way he acts. And it, you know, it's, it's fantastic. I mean, it does have a drawback having him do this character as well, because it kind of ruins it for any future movies coming along. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Bruce, I mean, let's say Ben Affleck's never going to live up to this. Is yeah. <laughs> no. I mean, Pattinson, I like ben I, I'm not going to lie. I, I would that say that Robert Pattinson, that one was, I was impressed. I was actually, I went in very apprehensive and just saying, oh, I don't know how I'm going to like this. And I literally watched it a month ago. I hadn't seen it. And my friend was like, how, how have you not seen this? And I was like, I don't know. I just kind of passed me by. He does a great you know, I would say almost a little bit like he mimics the crow a bit, a little bit too much, but like bit. he yeah. does a great job in a very brooding torture. Yeah, Bruce. He's a great brood. It's a much yeah. different. I mean, it's, a it's, it's a, a Bruce tortured Bruce era. Wayne. Like yeah. it's like, I don't know if I want to live or die. And I guess I'm just going to do this for now. That's the way I felt that Bruce was. Okay. Well, he's, he's, he's the Bruce Wayne that came about in the post 9 11 era. I was yeah. going to say, grew up with a couple of recessions post nine eleven. Yeah, that's he's going to be a little bit more, a little bit more uh, burnout and and, yeah. and uh, hating of the world. Yeah, I have, and also I I'll do it on my yet. own, right? Like I'm not going to yeah. use my money. I'll do it on my own. I know how to yeah. build things. He's a he is a detective, so I do say with this that is a one element that does kind of miss with Bale is that you don't get the detective Batman you get like he does he has cool gadgets because yeah. his company paid for but you don't get the the Bruce that's like let me figure this out right everyone else is like figuring it out for him you know and it's like oh by the way it's this and this and this oh, okay great you know like and then he kind of is told 
oh, the serum got dumped into the water and it's activated. And Lucius is telling him, and he's like, do I, am I supposed to know what this means? Like, he's like, he's just like, yeah. And Rachel Dawes is pointing things out to him. And he's like, aha, okay. I gotta go. I gotta go to this building and figure yeah. this out. Yeah. Even but, I, I, but, I also, but I also take that to the fact, simple fact. The reason why I, maybe I kind of accepted that in this is because he's gone. He's, he's presumed dead before he comes back. So he doesn't, right. I mean, a lot can change in seven years time. So I kind of, yeah. I, is that I how kind of long he was there. gone? Yeah, yeah, he was gone seven years. years. Seven yeah. years, he's legally. I would dead. also. He was spending more time physically getting stronger and mentally getting stronger, but not like it's a one thing to have a whole education and go like, "Hey, I'm going to go to tech school or whatever," and like be a brain and be you know do all that. So I just he think dropped that, out of college, didn't he? he dropped out yeah. of Princeton. Yeah. And so he didn't off, continue. So what's went his went time frame? How old is Batman supposed to be right now? In this late twenties, mid no, he turned thirty. His birthday is thirty zero. Okay, okay. I was trying to. Yeah. I knew they had the birthday party, and I didn't see any. Yeah, so I think party. thirty. So he was mid twenties when he dropped out of school, and then yeah. Yeah, you know, uh, cape they made. They made his cape because I was wondering. His so cape was kind of cool. They made it with a technique called electrostatic blocking. And it was they, the crew had to learn how to do this from the Ministry of Defense, and it was to decrease night vision visibility of objects. So it was an actual parachute fabric brushed with a uh, like glue and stuff to make it make him look dark, you know? Yeah. When he would, it, it's such a flowing, cool cape. I mean, it was really actually, you know, military grade cape. <laughs> I mean, I love all the tech in this in this, and it and it yes. makes sense. Like that's the thing that's like. Because a lot, a lot of films too. Where all like, that try stuff to, comes from? Where did yeah, you get all just, these toys? Yeah. No, but it just makes sense. Versus, like in some movies, it's like, oh, I can build this, no problem. And they're literally in their garage, you know, like I'm gonna make a suit, you know. And you're like, no, no, like this, this is like, oh, I have to just spray it. It's it's <laughs> all well, sense. and this it's all military stuff that yeah, like military grade hardware that he's yeah, the, the, yeah, that, it that, all that, is. You know, the government was like, we don't want to spend three hundred thousand dollars per soldier to give them this this suit. Yeah. yeah. Well, another thing is we don't know time frames as well. That's kind of a bit shaky. A I mean, the thing is, when he comes back to Gotham until he does the final battle, we could be talking about a year or two, two or three years going on yeah. here. Yeah. Because you don't yeah. know. Because if you think about it, by the time he gets the back, hey, by the time he evacuates, okay, by the time he makes this, when builds it, yeah, stuff, that's true. Builds that. I mean, yeah. that's going to take time because it's, it's only him and build, um, him build. Yeah, how do they build the together, back so. cave? Just the two of them. Oh my God, really? Well, I mean, they were able to at least kind of elaborate that it was a it was a uh, underground underground foundation yeah. underground. So, well, no, but it had it had the mechanism to go up and down and stuff. But it's like, how do you? You know. Well, it was the Underground Railroad, but they had, but it was also the, the housing East Side Foundation. So I guess everything was already there, and I guess yeah. they just needed to. Yeah. They needed yeah. to build the the gadgets and the and the actual space to or housing, to yeah, for housing. everything. Housing, yeah. and and I guess they would have to find a way to get the back car out of the. Yeah, I know point. the bat, the Batmobile. <laughs> they had to build a driveway. <laughs> yeah, they're like, like, it they, 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 they were trying to describe too? what it was. The Batmobile. They're going. It's a black tank. Well, can you imagine also <laughs> too, like having out. contractors come in and do the work and like you want to yeah, build so. a driveway into a cave? Like, just shut up and do it. <laughs> Like, yeah, you know, I mean, somebody like, had to build the back cave. There's no yeah. way that they had enough manpower between yeah. him and an old butler to do that shit. So something <laughs> but, had to happen somewhere. They did I mean, at least give you a. We do, we do get we do get a very primitive back cave in this yeah. anyway, yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. But the same because basically it's like you know I think he's just using it as a workshop to put his outfit together really. Yeah, and, uh, and to and make his gadgets, his little. And, 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 and the only the only electronic. I mean, there's no back computer. There's no. Yeah. No. None of that at the, at that time. The only thing they pretty much had to get working probably was the elevator getting it up and down sort of thing really. I and think by the yeah. third film is where they actually add in the technology aspects, but also yeah. the repercussions of the technology and the aspects. So that was like well, a very interesting progression to that. But that is blowing up. That's blowing up um, Wayne Manor as well. And so that gives you kind of a reboot. A so, reset. Start, yeah. so that basically, if you're going to rebuild the manor, you can pretty much put things where you want to now. <laughs> yeah, pretty <laughs> much. And, and yeah. They, 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 they make it clear, like in this movie now, Lucius Fox is now aware of everything. Whereas in the beginning of the movie, yeah. he's like, oh yeah, I'm using the suit to go spelunking. And you can yeah. tell right away 
Shut with, up. With Morgan Freeman. He's so like, oh, well, he was like, he, he's like, I, he's like, what is his line? I'm an educated man. Don't treat me like I'm dumb. Like, like yeah. he's like, don't. Yeah, yeah no. He went, what he it's your go. stuff what anyway. The way I see it, this all belongs to you, Mr. Yeah. Wayne. And I, I love, I love Face his jumping. line at the end Face when the other jumping. guy gets fired. You didn't get the memo? I, I loved. Oh my god. Oh my god, that was excellent. Yeah. But this actually. But this movie actually shows him kind of building. You know, a small team, but a team. And you could see yeah, where you know, Lucius Fox would be the guy who'd be like, no, he's we the gadget man at Wayne at Wayne Industries. You got you got your El, you got Alfred who's looking, he's your point man, who's who's gonna yeah, and he always has to bring all the gas chicks home. You ever notice Alfred's always bringing everybody home? He shouldn't be. They need someone just to do that shit. The butler taking well, cast out women that. home from Wayne Manor, that's gonna cause something. That's that's <laughs> yeah. not no. that's not a good look. <laughs> not a good look. Oh. But All I mean, it takes is one, one drunken chick taking the wrong elevator, winding up in the back cave. <laughs> <Yeah. go> to- <laughs> they're like, no, they're like, oh, he's got a dungeon. Look at him. He's kinky. Uh, <laughs> I will say this. I do, I do like the fact that they did take at least a couple of seconds to explain that he was buying his mask and the parts for his mask in bulk. Yeah, yeah. Dumb- yeah. So that so way he could- he's um, tried to explain that. All right, he but he bought so many of these parts. We'll have spares, but yeah. at least yeah. they're trying to explain. All right, this is how we'll get it in. They didn't do it with the bat with the with the Batmobile or anything else, but they we, were at least trying to. Yeah, they were. This is probably the first one I've ever I've ever seen trying to explain where they got all their stuff from. Yeah, to start implementing it into their crime fighting life. The but one I thing mean, I thought lot- that would be kind of cool is that they would have tied in because you get in a larger sense that the city has this sort of, you know, nefarious system that's in place yeah. that no one well, knows about. A crook. I know, but I wish it would have introduced the court of owls, which are kind of doing now and they're doing a lot more, but it, it is sort of like this underlying thing. That's always been the combo books. That would have been a great right, right. way to just kind of say the deeper problem. Isn't all these little individual things. It's this, organization that is literally controlling the movement of everything that's happening in Gotham, you know? I do give it, it has some Easter eggs in there, like when Batman goes and visits Commissioner Gordon and he tells Barbara to get back inside. Yeah, yeah. That was well, Bar- nice. Barbara and Barbara Jr., because she's got Barbara, she's got Barbara Baby inside, so. So his yeah. wife is Barbara and his the daughter is is a junior. Which is gonna be which will eventually become Batgirl. Yeah. So that was quite yeah. that's quite like, oh, that's quite nice that they actually just I mean it's just one simple throwaway line, but it's like, oh, okay, that's cool. Well, they also have other characters that if you're a huge comic book fan, you'll know just by the mention of the names that you're like, Oh, that's this guy, you know, they have Victor other characters. Scarecrow doesn't yeah, come so back Zaz. after this, does he? Or yeah, he does he? Yeah, yeah, he does. He's He's in the he's final. In, he's in the finale. He's in all three final. movies, actually. Yeah. He's in all three. He's, yeah. He's oh, that's in, right, because he's, he's in Arkham, right? He's in. Ar- he's in the yeah. begin. He's in. He's in the this one. He's in the beginning. Uh, when they're doing the arms deal with the dogs, that he's in the beginning of that. And in, in uh, Dark Knight, and in Dark Knight Returns, he's the uh, conducting judge in the Kangaroo Court. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So they wow. do an amazing yeah, job tying good. in these characters, which is it just, you know, from a fanboy perspective, it's like, oh my God, it's so cool how they were able to. And, uh, and honestly, watching The Dark Knight and seeing Harvey Dent, I was like, oh, the first time I'm watching The Dark Knight, not knowing anything, I'm like, oh, they got Harvey Dent, so he's going to be the villain in the next movie. Yeah. Oh, wait, no, now? <laughs> uh, but it's also amazing that they didn't start with the Joker, which is brave, really brave, because they could have, did very like it's the same thing with superman my biggest problem with superman is stop fucking starting with lex stop yeah just stop yeah. like stop every time you make a movie every like, single movie. yeah 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 every <laughs> like, we movie, got it, yeah. you know i got a real um, estate scheme yeah so i'm Everyone. it's great <laughs> that they did that like to start with you know scarecrow and then race and you know um, well it's it, it's like gordon points out at the end it's what you're doing right now is setting the precedent of of escalation if you yeah. you know you're wearing them what's to stop these these crazies from now wearing a mask take this guy for instance and he hands him the the playing card it's brilliant yeah yeah that was i kind of wish, i kind of wish that um christopher nolan would have gone on and did a couple more because there was talk of like joseph gordon levitt playing the riddler and things like that no like, he oh, jason man. gordon he would have been amazing as a nightwing he would have been the next batman he would have been a great and and a rejection yeah, to that well. because he was given the helm and and imagine trying to be that and being like 
yeah, I don't want to do this. Like, I don't want to be the good guy. Sometimes I have to be the bad guy. And that's what Nightwing is. So I think it would have been a well, he would have to become Robin before he became Nightwing, though, as far as the, like to follow the procession, because you can't I don't know if you can just have Nightwing show up without that Robin backstory. Right. No, but like because... the last one kind of ends with Batman saying, here, take my legacy. Right. And so he yeah. could start at trying to be a Batman. And and you I they alluded to that. two yeah. they alluded to two boys that uh jason gordon levert like his character was interacting with in in the height sort of area and mm. those characters could be one of them could have been his robin right and trying to do the right thing and 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 saying that you thought this is a batman you know but it's not like this is you know a different batman who mm. now is starting the legacy of the robin and batman right like you so it's it would have been amazing. I don't know why they just didn't because he would have been fantastic being in this. So like, I take it know. nobody likes George Clooney's Batman. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's, it, what's the, it, there's nothing it, to it, there's, He's George there's, Clooney. It's you yeah. just you just have He's to just like I, I enjoy it for the schlock it is. Oh yes, it's a, it's a one yeah. thing it's, you don't, it's, you don't like Uma it's, Thurman. She was great. I think the it's, best part about the film is the villains, not, yeah. not again, I, I go well, back to that, you know. That, that, ha that also has to do with that if you, if you look at the 89 Batman and the Batman Returns, if you look at it, Michael Keaton doesn't get mentioned at all in any of the critic stuff or anything like that. It's no. all about how great Jack Nicholson is, how great Michelle Pfeiffer is, oh, You're Danny right. DeVito, oh, what's Pee Wee Herman doing in this? And, you know, that's pretty much all the press that you get. It and Michael right, Keaton's yeah. pretty not mentioned at all. There's nothing about his performance. It's really hard to find critical um about his performance they, it's almost like he's not even in it sometimes yeah it's like oh i'm surprised he actually could do something more than beetlejuice that's pretty much what they say that's it you know and i was look at surprised Michael to see him in the role of batman when that came out well i, I mean it's, it's, i love it's it nice, in it though it's nice to be surprised that, that you know that he's in it but it, it would be nice to someone that actually mentioned it if they liked him or not yeah that's, you know, that's right i've got some of the things that i thing haven't seen a review you mentioned kim basinger kind of suffering after batman but michael keaton i don't remember him in shit after batman he didn't do much after this because i mean again it's like imagine doing a film that you think is going to launch you you know into something and it just doesn't you know well, well launched him into money well he did I mean, other there, stuff. There, 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 he did no other there's stuff. a yeah. there's a reason there's a reason behind that michael keaton was frozen out for a while Michael Keaton's contract was to do five Batman films. He dropped out of the second one, so he his, his he was frozen out of the movie industry for a while. Oh, so they're like, "Well, you're done completely." Got it. He yeah. he broke his contract. Yeah, yeah. You okay. Um, I can see that. Um, legit. Which is well, a shame because that, even the one with Michelle Pfeiffer and like I, I mean, again, a Catwoman. If there was ever a Catwoman, Jesus. <laughs> like and Danny DeVito, like I mean, that was you know. You know, I have to either say that Batman Returns has a lot more um, emotional resonance than the Batman nineteen eighty nine. The only because yeah. I think it, I think it's that Penguin storyline that's quite heartbreaking, really. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, and that yeah. kind of gives it that. I mean, to be honest, that was more heartbreaking than seeing Bruce Willis. The Wayne. Danny DeVito Penguin story. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I thought he was just a nasty little shit. No, yeah, no, yeah, but, but it's but sad what happened. Like his parents thrown into a river. That. I mean, he, he was, was born. Just... He was born the way he was born. His parents are like, ew, like dump that in the they, water. Like they just and they dumped, like, they, dumped him, him they dumped him in a river like a like unwanted cats. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, did you see him? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, he but, 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 but he did eat the cat. Yeah. But, but the thing is, it gave, it gave you a lot more. It's like, oh, my God, these parents are actually killed their child. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, yeah. And then, and yeah. Was like, he was such a was nasty little, a little... He, was, he was a disgusting human being in that movie. Danny DeVito yeah, was but... so good at that. Though. Well, he was raised in the sewers. I mean, so, raised yes. in the sewers by penguins. I, I know. Mean... I was going to say, that's a very... Um, <laughs> maybe in the Gotham Bronx, City, the penguins though. just were like, hey, oh, we're going gonna, gonna to go down and have our own little... Those Gotham well, Zoo penguins are, are a lot more harsher than the Lincoln Park Zoo. Yeah, and yeah. big. Yeah, and, big. Say, and, it, and, it, and it does <laughs> and that does play into um, Tim Burton's strength, which is snow. <laughs> he yeah. loves the snow. Yeah, loves the snow. <laughs> he loves his wintry flair. You know, he loves yeah. his flurries. So it works well with that. I thought well. that was one of the darker films. One 
that oh, way. Oh, it's absolutely. Oh, is. definitely. I mean, look at and, and even Catwoman. You know, Selena gets pushed out a window like that. I know. I mean, that was a dark ass scene. I just well, thought it was you know, funny when she goes to yeah. her and Batman realize who they are. Does this mean we have to start fighting again? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I also think with Batman Returns, I think that Tim Burton had a lot more clout. And he was left alone. I don't. I think yeah. Batman. That's the first one. He wasn't left alone. No. And there was a, probably a lot of fighting going on with productions and all the other stuff going through yeah that makes a ton of money it's like okay you do this because he wanted he did batman returns because he wanted to do edward scissor hands yeah that's well, he, got a, he got a bigger budget right so you do well the first time around you get a bigger budget to do even better you know well it also gives you clout that you can do what you want yeah. and then that led to all the parents reviling batman returns because i remember we sell these toys and happy meals Oh, yeah, yeah. you got Cat, Catwoman <laughs> being hypersexual, and the movie's so dark. Penguin bites off a guy's nose. There's child yeah. abduction. There's all this really dark stuff in the movie. So but you yeah, can't help but laugh in Watertown. You can't help but laugh. It's like a parent don't really know about comic books, do they? <laughs> Clearly, no, they don't. They really. But that's what happens it. when you leave Tim Burton alone. Is Tim Burton's going to give you dark? The yeah. new penguin action figure with nose biting action. Yeah, <laughs> Happy Meals have gotten so freaking lame now. <laughs> and even what even when uh, what's what was the guy who is the other guy the mayor dude who Selena you know Catwoman just fries Walken. him. Christopher, Christopher yeah, Christopher Walken. Walken fries him. You know at the end, you know. As Max so, Shrek, which we get Tim coming. Burton's Tim Burton's love for classic horror, he names. Christopher Walken's character after uh, the, the guy who plays Nosferatu. Well, he always tells the story that he was uh, deathly afraid to work with Christopher Walken, and he was he was dreading asking him to be a part of this movie. He wanted really? to be good for it, but he was he was scared to death of him because of his performances. He thought he really was the guy that he played on screen, <laughs> and then he brought him back for Sleepy Hollow too. Yeah, yeah. and he was terrifying in that, so he knew, he knew what he was talking about. I love Man, the same thing he did with Fangoria back in back when Sleepy Hollow was coming out because uh, they uh, because of the CGI for the Headless Horseman they had to put a blue hood on uh, on Christopher Walken for the scenes where he's headless and he was joking that uh, he's making the world's most ex uh, most expensive Santo movie. So <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, he's positively evil in that. I love him uh, in the Headless Horseman. Oh, he looks terrifying. Christopher Walken. I mean, he's scary as shit. Terrifying. I mean, he is probably the scariest horseman I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. As far as any of them. And then he threw all that scariness away to dance in a music video. And they kind of, now we think of him as a nice little cuddly person, don't we? Like a hairspray. <laughs> that video. <laughs> loves to dance. Uh, uh, Weapon of Choice. Weapon by, of uh, Choice Fat by Slam. Boy Slim. Yeah. I don't yeah. remember that. Now someone else is going to go watch it. it. It's actually a really uh, good video. Directed by Spike Jones. It's a really, really great video. Oh, I was going to say, it can't be that bad. And Christopher Walken, before he became a serious actor, was actually a dancer. Um, I never knew that. I didn't he know tries that. to slip in a dance scene in every, it was small or big, in every single I one of his movies. I didn't know that. Yeah. I just think Including he's the Deer watch. Hunter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love Deer well, Hunter. Don't get me going. I mean, and, and the thing about it, if you look at Christopher Walken's career, no matter what he plays, it is kind of a choreographed acting that he kind of does with everything he does. There's all everything has a purpose. Everything has an exact mood. Will he ever live down the more cowbell moment? I doubt it. Um, I was reading an interview with um, about Christopher Walken. They said that Christopher Walken's like Robert Preston in The Music Man. Which basically means that when Robert Preston did The Music Man, every note, every single time they filmed it, every single step, he was everywhere he needed to be every single time. And he had to do each number, they had to do number like 20 to 25 times so that we can get it. And he'd be every exact every time. Christopher Walken was the same way. Any time that you did a shot, it was the same exact way at every single shot. Doesn't matter what he was doing or where he was at. They knew that no matter what you gave him, it was exactly the same. He was very metered and Which... measured like that directors love and editors love because that's it's easy to easy to cut around you then it's easy to cut things with you i always thought that it's, it's a shame that christopher walken came out after alfred hitchcock because alfred hitchcock probably would have used them in everything <laughs> you know because he was like boop 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 same same performance no matter what i remember no it was actually tony it was tony scott who said that when he did them for uh was it true romance or was it true romance yeah, he's in Toronto. Yeah. 
So I think it, I think it was an interview I was reading with Tony Scott saying about Christopher Walken when he's doing Trivial Minutes. So I think I, I, I remember the the first short film I tried to direct. Um, one of the actresses did not understand that when I did uh, when I did another shot, I need you to try to do it as close to the to the way you did it the first time as possible. And like she was like, but. I want to give you a different performance. So you have stuff to cut. I'm like, no, 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 you don't understand. If I'm going from this angle to this angle, you need to act exactly the same way. Like exactly. I'm the shooting same. it on this, on this angle. So we can actually edit it later. She was Did you guys there. catch that uh, when they were, when all the prisoners were released from Arkham, they, they, they briefly showed Doc, uh, Mr. Zaz. Yeah, Zaz killer. is one Did of the characters. Did you see that? Yeah, yeah. I didn't catch that. I'm well, they show Zaz later too in, in the, the courtroom. The fog. Yeah, well, Rachel, yeah, in the fog uh, too. That's where Rachel calls out Scarecrow for uh, you know, basically giving bad psychological exams and committing. Oh, yeah. okay, okay. To he played the the, um, he, the Victor Hugo character, sort of yeah. the, that way. So I think what we'll do is why don't we give a comparison of which you like best, if there is a one that you like best. So starting with you, Vicky, which do you like better, Batman Begins or Batman from 1989? I like them both. I don't know. I I, I can't. I, the, the differences are there. There is a lot. But I mean, as far as saying I like one over the other, because 1989 was like yeah, but you like got to pick the, one, Vicky. The That's the rules. One of the best decades of my life. So if you if they were dangling from wires, you have to pick between one of them. You have or to they pick one. I, I, well, I like it a lot better if they wouldn't do it with Blu-ray. But no, I'd have to say, as far as production wise, it would have to be Batman um, Begins, just because. And, okay. I mean, now it, everyone, you know, else, just, now everyone else doesn't have to pick one. Only Vicky. <laughs> <laughs> I'll fuck Sucker. off, man. Does this to me all the time. I'm so overwhelmed with the <laughs> testosterone coming through my computer. But mm -hmm. they're both great. But as far as production and and for just basic coolness, you have to go for. Batman begins, but I still love Michael Keaton and his version. I do. It's a, they both get a bit huge thumbs up over five stars. Either way, I mean, I can't see where you go wrong watching either one of them. And what about yourself, Joe? I love them both, but I mean, if you're going to ask me, story like like set design wise, it's it's the '89 Batman, but story wise, and just. The acting, the story, the better yeah. overall package is Batman Begins. Mm -hmm. It's and the, the way the story's told is much more. Um, uh, Do you think they jumped off the old one for like a storyboard kind of thing, and then well, we're gonna do this different. They did this, so let's do that. You know, I mean, they could because they well, have better effects and stuff. Well, maybe to a degree, but I feel like just, I mean, Bur Burton, like we said earlier. You know, before Burton did this, the mass media view of Batman was Adam West. So Burton kind of changed the game. Yeah. But I mean, if we're just talking like I'm just looking at both of them on my shelf right now, like if we're talking about like just which one's just a better overall movie, just more satisfying of a story, more satisfying uh, villains and all that stuff. It's Batman Begins. Well, maybe. It's hard. Nick, They're both Nick, good. Nick, Nichols, Nicholson's so over the top that that, that that he's great, and I feel like maybe this one th this one didn't build the villains up as much because it, it, it kind of split it between three of them. But they were all very well done. Batman Begins, I feel like, just the better movie overall. Mm -hmm. What about yourself, John? Uh, I am going to say Batman Begins just because I am a huge I am a fanboy of Nolan's versions of these films. Um, I could say that there are a lot of qualities about, you know, uh, the other Batman. Batman, what, what's the first one? Batman? Right. Batman. Yeah. Batman. So the first Batman, I mean, it had to set a bar, right? Because that was the first Batman film. Right. And I think they did an amazing job pulling elements from a comic book and turning it into something and making something out of it. I feel like the story is more about the villain and Gotham than it was about Bruce and Batman. Um, this, you know, again, had everything to me. So, you know, I'm going to say Batman Begins. What about yourself, Sean? Uh, 
you've but everyone's making compelling arguments i'm honestly torn myself uh i'd probably say the better movie is batman begins i have a fondness in my heart for nicholson as the joker i think that his it's villain, hard to diss it's, that it's, it really it, is it's amazing it, yeah. it transcends the entire first four movies the the original four so it's kind of hard to not to overlook that i also love the look of tim burton's gotham I yeah think it's absolutely gorgeous and I I also appreciate the fact that they kind of just hit the ground running. He's already Batman in this world. But right. Batman Begins is the better movie. It is without a without question the better movie. And I always do have a, a soft spot in my heart in my heart for uh, Killian Murphy as the Scarecrow. I think he's fantastic in that role. Oh and, yeah. And he really jumps out. He so is really Batman good. Begins, Batman, Batman Begins, yes. Begins for me. Uh, myself, I'm going to say Batman Begins. I prefer that. I can watch that any time, though. I do give a nod to Batman, the 1989 Tim Burton, because if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't have my beloved Batman animated series, which I think is one of the best yeah. things I've ever, you know, yeah. I ever have. And it I have such a love for that, admit. which also leads to Batman Beyond, which also yeah. gives me a... You know, f- f- um, and the Batman the video ones. games that are that are huge now are kind of off yeah. to Burton, and too, it, it, so... It's, it's, it's all based on the Tim Burton one, so I can't I can't overlook it. Um, and I do, I kind of like that. I like the stylization of the Batman. I just kind of wish. I don't think Tim Burton was one hundred percent invested in it. It just has that kind yeah. of a thing in, I, and that's it lacks the emotional resonance. And if it had that emotional <laughs> resonance, I would be all over it, sort of thing. I, yeah. I think, but I fi- but I find myself if I'm going to watch a Batman film of that of the the 89 to 90s films i tend to go for batman returns before i hit this batman which yeah is, I, i'm which the is same way for a yeah. sequel i think so. it's also they listen to maybe the fans of the first movie they listen to the fans of the comic books and they're like hey if you just did these things it would be a much stronger movie and they took that knowledge and were like you know only if the walking dead listened to its fans <laughs> yeah i <laughs> know the thing is, as far yeah. as rewatchability, I feel like the '89 Batman is maybe more rewatch friendly because it's so light, because it's it's kind of more lighthearted. But yeah, like like Keith said, I feel like Burton wasn't invested in the storytelling. He was more invested in I'm going to make reference to Vincent Price movies. I'm going to I'm going to have ax, I'm going to have the Batmobile going through act through Axis Chemicals through Bay Four which the way it's spelled out looks like Bava, so he could pay tribute to Mario Bava. No kidding. Want, I didn't. If, you, if you look at it, it looks like it says Bava because it's Bay 4 that he's going yeah. through. Mario yeah. Bava is Tim Burton's favorite director. I did not um, notice that. Jerry Hall's mask. He paid homage to uh, Eyes Without a Face with Jerry Hall's mask. Absolutely on that one. Uh, Sam yes. Hamm, uh, Sam Hamm on record said that that's what what they were going for. So Burton was more interested in I want to make I want to make the matte painting from Hammer Films as <laughs> you know as a, a, you know as an entire you know movie that I feel is like what he was going for. I felt like that's maybe where he was focused. He wanted to create like this visual this visual thing and story be damned. But I think it makes you know it makes the movie more fun. Whereas Batman Begins. Isn't as much fun. It's just a much better movie. It's a much better story, much better narrative. Batman 1989 reminds me of an afternoon movie where Batman begins with something you want to see in the evening. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Why. Exactly. It's kind yeah. of a matinee. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. 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 Well, you can just put it on like on a Sunday well, and just like, okay, so it's a rainy Sunday. Or it's almost a little bit begins. dark, though, with all the other shit that it goes down. There it also just feels like Batman something begins, that's a little bit of like a. A mystery of it, right? Like kind of like the Bond. Yeah. The Bond movies give you a little bit of a mystery to make you think. Whereas, like you know, Batman, you just sit back and watch. And you're like, oh, that's a cute scene. Oh, that's funny. You know, like you you don't really have to think about what's going on. You just you see it. Versus and all Batman three of the Nolan films, you're like, to you're watch trying to think about what the hell. Yeah. Wait, what's going on? And who's doing what? <laughs> you know, like. Yeah. You got to pay attention to Batman Begins, where Batman, you can just watch it. <laughs> Batman Begins, you have to pay attention, I think. I think that maybe that's the two differences. Yes, absolutely. Uh, yes. Yeah, you do, have to, you do have to watch it more, and you do have to pay more attention. But at the same time, it's, it's just so much... It, it, still, it still keeps you engrossed. Batman Begins still keeps you engrossed. Like, last night, watching it, I, I needed to go get water, and I didn't want to pause it. To go get one. It just brings like, out the kid in you. It really does. So 
I mean, everybody like when, when it's done that, they have done their job. When you don't want to go take a leak, you know that they have done a good job. And that's just the way this movie is just riveting. It is. Batman Begins. I can't, you can't sing it's owed enough. This is the end of the Literature License Podcast. Our next Make Remake episode will be The Mummy from 1932 and The Mummy from 1999. Um, uh, the, again, the Mummy and Bride of Frankenstein are playing at uh, Fathom Events on October 1st. I know, I'm so looking for Fathom, Fathom Events. Go check it out. Now I'm looking for see, those. You can go see the 32 Mummy on the big screen. I am looking forward to that one. Oh, Sorry I would to cut love you off. it. Sorry to cut you off. No problem at all. And of course, um, next week we'll be doing our M&M, which is Monsters and Mad Men. We'll be doing The Shape of Water by Del Toro and The Creature from the Black Lagoon double feature. And of course, next um, next month, we'll, we'll start again with our books of screen, which will be Hush Hush Sweet Charlotte, but with Betty Davis and Livy de Havilland. But we'll also be doing the book that is based on by Henry Farrell called Whatever Happened to Cousin Charlotte. And of course, our Batman be um, our Batman anime series will continue with the next four episodes, which will be from Pay Attention, Vicky. Shut <laughs> up. <laughs> I have to go through and find all the episodes. They are not in order. They aren't. So we'll be we'll be covering the episodes: Pretty Poison, The Underdwellers, <laughs> POV, and of course, The Forgotten. And of course, Doctor Who from our sister prom podcast episodes. Will who are now conglomerated into us we'll be doing their doctor who and their next one will be doctor who versus the daleks from 1964 wow so it's good night for myself good night vicky good night everybody good night joe good night everyone good night sean good night everybody good night john good night folks and see you next week for the shape of water and the creature from the black lagoon looking back at my past where i had to had to make a choice about my purpose in life what i did was that i slipped myself into and i made a choice in favor of survival what i did was that i split myself into yeah and today If you wanna fight all the night Lonely one sits to get outside His only passion is the sky There is a man deep inside If you wanna fight all the night Lonely one sits to get outside His only passion is the sky Now I look at myself and what I see Is a man who's lying to himself Oh why? That's a price too high
Don't 